things like anxiety, you know, people come to me with anxiety mm. issues, right? It's like, well, anxiety was important when you were running away from lions because the physiological mm. response of anxiety would end for in one of two circumstances. You either successfully ran away from the lion or you fucking died because the lion ate you. Whoa. One of those yeah. two things ended that norepinephrine, cortis you know, this massive like send the blood to the brain and the muscles and beat the heart fast and breathe harder and all the things. And now it's like, how am I going to pay for my kid's college? And that lion never, ne you never get away from that lion and that lion never kills you. What's cooking everybody. If you are on YouTube right now, please hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button on the video, and as always, if you have a second, would love to see you drop a comment down in the comment section as well. As I say every week to everyone who leaves the likes and comments on these videos, it is a huge help. Let's keep it rolling. You guys are helping grow this channel, and I really, really appreciate all of you. To everyone who is listening on Apple or Spotify, thank you for checking out the show there. If you haven't already, be sure to follow on either one of those platforms and leave a five-star review if you have a second. And I look forward to seeing you guys again for future episodes. And by the way, I, I did mention last week the sharing around of the episodes and the clips is also an enormous help. So that everyone has been doing that. I do look at my analytics. There's There's been some decent numbers over the past few weeks. I really, really appreciate it. That helps get the word out. It helps figure out how eventually we're going to start pages like on Reddit and stuff like that for this show. So that when we drop an episode, it can also have like a third party resource that's putting out that an episode dropped. We got to get there, but it all starts with people sharing the show and creating some buzz around it. And so I really, really appreciate everyone who's taking the time to do that. Now, I am joined in the bunker today by Dr. Joseph Sambataro. And I ain't going to lie. We got to a lot more than I thought we were going to. This was an action-packed episode of a lot of different topics across all kinds of medical ideas. You can probably use your imagination on that as to some of the things we talked about. But I think it was a very, very important conversation to have, let's just say, given the state of things right now. And I'll, I'll be very vague this week in the intro and leave it there. So that said, you know what it is. I'm Julian Dory, and this is Trend Fire. Let's go. This is one of the great questions in our culture. Where is the nuance? You're giving opinions and calling them facts. You feel me? Everyone understands this, but few seem to do it. If you don't like the status quo, start asking questions. You didn't become a doctor until 28. I didn't start to become a doctor until... Uh, no, I started medical school at 30. That's what I meant. You didn't yeah. start medical school until 30. I 30. thought it was 28. Holy shit. 28, I was in graduate school, sort of like trying to bolster my application to make sure that I... You know, I didn't want to do this more than once. I didn't want to apply more than once. So um, I was, you know, I got a master's, well, I went to a master's program for biomedical science at the same school that I wanted to go to, you know, Rutgers Newark. And, um, and that was when I was like 28. So by the time I started, yeah, it was like about to turn 30. Like we started that August, I'm born in August. So that, that August and uh, yeah, I was 30 years old. No shit. Yeah. So you did, you had to do a couple year program or something entirely different before then. Well, just undergraduate, you know what I mean? But I like because you've been to college, though. I thought. Yeah, so I went to college right out of high school, and it didn't go well. I just kind of was wasn't an adult yet, you know what I mean? Like gotcha. I, so I always like wonder how we ask like eighteen year old kids to make decisions about like, hey, here's like you want to borrow a couple hundred thousand dollars to like <laughs> figure it out, right? Um, but yeah, so I didn't do well. But then like kind of just figured out, you know, got my head out of my ass when I was like twenty six. I went back to school, and I was going to teach. Uh, phys ed, I was coaching uh, football. I was doing, I was working with like special education uh, program children as an aide and so on and so forth. So went back to school and I just like, it mattered to get an A, you know what I mean? Like and yeah. I cared about like doing well in school and I was like racking them up and I go, that thing about being a doctor that I always thought about, like maybe I could do it, right? So took the MCAT, you know, did well enough to get in. Um, and I, like I said, I didn't, I was, it was late to the game, so I didn't want to do it why I didn't want to have to apply on two cycles. So I said, what do I got to do to make sure I get in? So there's these master's degrees that you can go get that sort of like, if you do well enough, 
the curriculum is sort of interwoven with medical school curriculum. And then they'll say like, hey, we'll give you an extra look if you sort of like, you know, do this coursework. Mm. So I went there and I was able to knock on wood, perform well enough to sort of like, you know, um, make sure that I didn't have to wait two cycles. Because it's devastating at that point in life to have to wait another year to start. Oh my God. Which is already an eight year, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. What what the full thing is, including residency, like to get all the way through to say like, you are now Dr. Sambataro. It's- it, it is eight years, right? So it depends on what you do. So you're a doctor after you get your degree from medical school, which is four years, but you are so not prepared to do anything with that degree. Like if you're a P and you get your PhD as a doctor, you could, you know, you know, the thing you studied as an so MD. you could go do it. No shit. Yeah. You get an MD after your medical school is over, but then in order to practice medic- medicine clinically, you have to do at least an intern year and then right. a residency. Right. And then the residency lengths are varying depending on what you do. Like I got buddies that are doing neurosurgery that are like, they're going to be residents for another three, I mean, it's like a seven, eight, nine years, depending on what you do. Internal medicine happens to be three years. So four years of graduate school, four years of medical school, and three years of residency is absolute minimum in the United States. Makes sense. Right. So yeah. you're looking at, you know, you're looking at that long, but most people have some level of, you know, extra training or, you know, lengthy whatever. So it could go anywhere from, you know, 10, 11 to like 15 to 17 years. <sighs> On, on the one hand, you hear something like that and you're like, that's crazy. Yeah. Like to ask for that kind of buy-in. You basically, especially once you're coming out and you're doing the things like the residency and stuff, you're getting the graveyard shifts. You're doing the 36-hour stuff and, and things like that sometimes. So it's like the toll on you is insane. Yeah. At I mean, the same time, though, you're a doctor. Yeah. Right? Like you – as a citizen, yeah. you want the best of the best doing this. You want the people who eat, sleep, and shit this yeah. stuff all the time. I can you know see what that I mean? being the case. Yeah, I mean – yeah. So the thing about the – so residency is hard, right? And I, I have specific feelings about medical training in the United States because like – Oh, dude, divulge. It's brutal, <laughs> right? And it's – here's the thing. Like the old, the old guard will be like, oh, in my day, you know. Right. So like the running sort of theory behind how residency was created is the, you know, the dude, the dude at Johns Hopkins, the surgeon. I think it was William Halstead who was uh, – a surgeon at the turn of the century and had this amazing ability to operate without getting – like his patients didn't get infections. I mean there wasn't antibiotics and I go, how? And this guy's up for like three days in a row and he makes his his students stay up with him three days. They're operating all day, every night. Turns out he was just absolutely crushing rails of cocaine like <laughs> nonstop. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, hey, that makes sense. Uh. But then like flash forward to now, it's like they're still asking, you know – doctors to make you know do 30 30 what so they made rules on how to, how many could work in a maximum week but those rules are sort of like you know write it down how they want you to so your program yeah. doesn't get in trouble so point is is that like it is it is brutal um they you know they beat you up and when it's over when you're in it you're like i i want to change this like you're so motivated to change and when it's over you're like Fuck that. (laughs) You got to be a special place in your heart to like go back and like try to change things. But at the same time, I do think, I do think in order to be good at it at all, to be adequate at all, you do got to get your butt kicked a bit. Yes. You got to see a lot of fucking patients, dude. You got to see a lot of things. You got to be able to like recognize stuff, you know, Um, you want to be really good at bread and butter stuff, but you also want to be able to notice when something is not bread and butter. What do you mean by that? You know, like, you know, everybody that comes in who can't breathe, it's like, okay, first and foremost, is it, you know, you're like, I'm going to go to brand, is it the heart or the lungs, right? But mm-hmm. it could be, it could be a combination of both. It could be, there could be a lot of things, but you know, if you see a spot on a lung and somebody who's coughing and has a fever, you're like, okay, it's pneumonia, right? And then what's the most common thing that causes pneumonia? Oh, okay. Strep, you know, sometimes staph. So you give them antibiotics that do that. But if there's, if there's another thing about the, the story and you haven't seen it enough, You'll miss, and mm-hmm. that person could get sicker, right? So if they happen to have a sodium that's off, or they have diarrhea as well, and I'm, you know, using this because we're outside of Philadelphia, but like <laughs> maybe it's Legionnaires' disease, and if you haven't, you know, spent enough time seeing patients where you never saw that, you might miss it. I thought you were going somewhere else with that. So can you explain that instead? So I le- thought you were about to make a Philly dunk joke on. No, me, I I trained in Philly, dude, Temple University. Okay. So all right, good. Uh, Legionnaires' disease was uh, discovered. In Philadelphia, oh, there was a really? conference of legion like uh, legionnaires, and the uh, they were at a hotel, 
and these these guys all got really sick and died and they were like they couldn't figure out what it was so like there was a pathologist who was on the case and he's like doing the autopsy he's like what is going on here right so uh i think there was like a forensic files episode or something on it and the dude was like at christmas party he's like i gotta go i gotta go like i gotta figure this out and it turns out it was this bacteria that was or you know this this organism le- legionella um that was causing and it was from the air conditioning it was it was in the it was like a, in a droplet form, and it was being spread throughout the hotel, and these guys were getting this respiratory this respiratory pneumonia, oh, shit. and wasn't responding to typical treatment, right? And so, when was that? Oh gosh, a long time ago, sixties like right? or something like yeah. that, you know. Um, but uh, but the point is, is that you know, I you do got to see a lot of patients. And you got to see a lot of pathology and you got to see a lot of treatments and you got to see a lot of like failure of, of, of like conventional treatment to sort of like have a backup plan. And I think, I think the really important thing in medicine is, is that like you understand that you could be wrong with your first thought and hospital day two is a really important day because everything you thought on the first day when you first meet the patient who's sick, then you get some of the feedback like that test was, no, I, that wasn't, po- that test was didn't tell me anything this one oh oh gosh that's that's that i was completely thinking it was this and it was that you know so mm. you know that's like you know my first covid patient that i ever saw didn't we're, we'll go there yeah but, we'll go there i'm sure but, we'll. but i but i was wrong we now, were all wrong when was that when like how early was it that was early it was like still a thing on tv you know it like was january like, are we talking no, like maybe february something like if I, if I, you know kind of thing okay that's fair yeah but uh like early you know and um the uh did your mind go straight to COVID? no no in fact no. so it, mm, the emergency department is the first you know they, they get everything first right and they have a general idea of what they're doing and er docs have to have such a wide breadth of knowledge that i it's like a trust but verify situation it's like they tell you that they think this is what's going on you go down there you see for yourself and you 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 know you take that doctor's thought right. process you yes. go okay I, 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 all right i'm going to see this patient when they said hey she's she can't breathe her oxygen's low and she's coughing, but not making any like phlegm, mucus, right? Um, we know she has congestive heart failure. That's what we think is going on. So I went down there and, you know, I'm, I'm doing my exam and I'm listening. And this isn't, ma- this is pre-mask, pre-anything, right? So I'm yeah. listening. And, February 2020. You're listening to the heart and lungs and, uh, you know, and she's just b- cough and blast in, in every like orifice that I have in my face. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not even thinking about it because like, I'm like, oh, sh- it, they think it's congestive heart failure. And there was a component of congestive heart failure there where like fluid is now backed up into her lungs. So she, her lungs is trying to unsuccessfully expel this fluid. And, um, so I give her some medication to make her remove some of that fluid. And then the second day of the hospital, she just tanks. Now she happened to be, um, she happened to be positive for HIV. So she didn't have a lot of ability to mount a huge, infection response Mm -hmm. there wasn't a big fever you know what i mean like there was a lot of things that sort of like wouldn't have told us like hey this this person has an infection she was a prime case for this is a problem if you get it correct so we had to pit we go what is you know hospital day two here she is she's worse after the initial treatment and workup big fever too obviously started she blasted one off yeah and her oxygen dropped like a rock and she had to go to the icu and you know um so they tested her and i get a big hand slapped on my shoulder in the middle of like doing what I'm doing there today. Like, you got to go home. I'm like, why? They're like, you have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. They said this in February. Yeah. I was like, oh gosh, I got to go home. And I, and I, you know, quarantine and I got the, sw- I had to come in occupational health checked on me every day and I got the swab and it was negative and I wound up not being infected, but I was exposed. Like we all, everybody who took care of that patient was exposed, whether it was late February or I don't remember the date, exp- whatever, whatever the earliest time was. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was going to say, because what's interesting is we didn't get data here yeah. until March. So then it had to be March. But they had the first case, though. I remember this. So maybe this maybe this part did come out in February. Actually, I think it did. But the first case reported here mm-hmm. was, it was 30 days after they claimed the first case was in China, which right. was around January 28th. Eighth, so January this is twenty seventh. So this like is that? March. This has to be March because I was on the regular hospital wards, and you know what I mean. Like so, it had to be had to be March. But point is, is like we hadn't had very many cases, if any, in our hospital at the time at Temple University Hospital. Right. And uh, you know, the point being is, it was like super scary for me because like I didn't like you know, 
this is this is like all of the things you could possibly have go wrong in a, early on was being pro- projected. You know yeah. what I mean? Like this is going to be the worst thing and it was really bad. But it, it certainly was like even scarier before it actually became a thing. It was so unknown. Dude, we're doing like – I remember talking about like if this thing spreads like – the one of my attendees at the time, if this thing spreads – as contagious as the, if it were as contagious as the regular flu with a mortality rate that they had at the time, they had, you know, at the time, like this is going to kill a shitload of people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, so that was, you know, we, I'm, you know, I'm nervous. I'm home and I'm like in my house and I can't leave. And like, I'm, you know, um, and I'm like, am I going to get sick? Like, I don't know who, you know, is this going to kill me? Um, and then I didn't get sick. And then I sort of like, then we just got, then it just happened. Then it just, we got in the swing of things. It just went, here it comes. Yeah. It's, it really depended where you were too. Sure. It, when you look back on it, of course it affected everywhere and, and on some level, but one of the pieces of the science that I have not gone and looked at recently that I'm curious about okay. is the whole viral load aspect mm-hmm. because, you know, I was up in North Jersey when this was going on. I was hanging around New York city. Mm-hmm. If, if you're from up there, which you are I as am. well, like, yep you know what that was it was it was bad yeah you know people were getting it people were dropping like flies yeah. and it was a real thing yeah. now you know are there plenty of people that had comorbidities sure yeah but you saw a lot of normal age even younger age people just like dropping in a way that then you maybe didn't see it at that level ever again right. after the beginning correct and i tend to think that you know without looking at the research it's like you, you got to wonder if that is just because they're so – It's first of all, it's new. Mm-hmm. It's Viruses are most powerful at their beginning sure. as well. The science does support that. But also, you know, there's literally – you know, no pun intended here, but pun intended. Like there's so much of it in the air yeah. that people are just getting massive amounts of yeah. it. And then hospitals are overrun. Yeah. And then, you, be, you know, you, you have the city shut down. Right. So if you look at like in North Jersey – so you have to ask yourself right off the bat, like, why North Jersey? Why New York City? Why North Jersey, right? So you have, like, this two, these two very, like, uh, this perfect storm type of scenarios where you have international airports and huge hubs of travel, huge hubs of people moving around. And then you have every the most densely populated part of the entire nation. Right. You look at, it, like, Jersey City, right, where you have multiple generations of people living in the same home, mm-hmm. right? Like, large, large groups of like families all occupying the same dwelling and multiple generations and people and somebody had to go out and earn money and do the grocery shopping etc so you know this kind of close cluster you know and then when you talk about viral load it's just a matter of like could you there is a threshold with which you know i would imagine if you could consider the, the amount of viruses like you know ping pong ball or you know like a like bingo ball like right. you know what i mean like like you know, the more you have, the better chance there are for you for for there to be you know uh, for attachment. You know and you're mean? talking general viruses. This isn't just COVID nineteen. This yeah, is just in general. Yeah, I mean, you have to have you know there has to be. I mean, think about think about, you know they're not related in any way. But think about like when we talk about viral load for things like HIV or hepatitis C. It's like viral load for HIV right now. Like you know we consider a viral load that's undetectable almost like a cure, right? Like, mm. you know, there's, um, we, we now say confidently that once your viral load is undetectable, that on, and uh, on certain medications that you are not going to transmit this through sex, you know what I mean? Really? So, yeah. So there's like, you know, HIV is sort of the quantitative virus where it's like, if there's a lot of copies, you know what I mean? Like that's when you're going to see, you know, measuring viral load and the amount of, uh, immune cells that the person has. And usually they kind of go against each other the more virus the less immune cells they have the cd4 count um but yeah so i think there's there's certainly a quantitative portion of virus that you need to be exposed you needed to be exposed to in order for it to get in you know what i mean like yeah you know um and then attach itself to your to the to particular and you know the particular protein in your in your lung cells that that it um you know that it did interestingly enough i was reading about some of the autopsy reports how this oh, how, how this fun. how <laughs> how this virus was different from like how it did its damage to say the flu right because everybody likes to compare it to the flu because the flu is deadly right mm-hmm. it really is um, and we it, do forget that but it is we do but the flu sort of does its damage by sort of altering the ability of certain cells in the lining of the lungs to kind of like it makes it it, it makes it a very a very nice environment for bacteria to come in and do their thing. 
Mm. And then the devastating pneumonia after the fact is is a bacterial pneumonia oftentimes. Well, quick question on that. Mm -hmm. When do we start the designation to pneumonia with with any type of virus where it moves to that? Like you mentioned spot on a lung or something right, like that. Right. Is that all it is? So a pneumonia is basically... I just want to thank 8 Sleep Chief of Staff Alex Horowitz once again for providing us with that beautiful statement last week, thanking our entire community here at Trend to Fire with Julian Dory for the impact we've had in propelling 8 Sleep to international success. I mean, really, it all starts and ends with what we've done here, and, and to to have him put that into words and allow me to read it on the show was a beautiful thing. Now, despite the fact that I wrote the entire statement myself, that's neither here nor there. I, I can confirm that that is very much what he would have wrote. That is the impact we've had here. And if you are out there listening right now and you haven't been a part of that impact because, I don't know, for some reason you don't want to improve your sleep or get your energy levels up throughout the week and maybe you just don't want to live that long because, frankly, a better sleep is correlated with a longer, healthier life. But anyway, if you haven't done any of that, and you'd like to at least learn about that side of the fence, the greener side of the grass, if you will. Use that link in my description for 8sleep, along with the code TRENDIFIER at checkout, and you will get $150 off your own 8sleep Pod Pro cover today. The 8sleep Pod Pro cover comes in queen or king sizes, it goes right on top of your current mattress, and it starts working for you the very first night you use it to make sure that your sleep is the most optimal sleep you've ever gotten. So as I always say, you'll sleep six hours, and feel like you slept eight. Like a, a like a lower respiratory tract infection that like so the, like once we get past just the airways and the you know the sinuses, the mouth, the, the the trachea, the main bronchi, all that stuff. Now we're in the lungs. Mm. We are a pneumonia clinically is um, you know shortness of breath, uh, chest pain or tightness, um, and cough. Fe the other signs of infection: fever, elevated white blood cell count. Um, sometimes you see decreased oxygen. And then when you say spot on the lung, it's usually because if the pneumonia is concentrated in one area, you can see it on a chest x-ray or a CAT scan. If it's spread out like a virus, the, these viral pneumonia typically like both sides of the lungs, kind of like patchy and everywhere it wants to be. So pneumonia is basically a diagnosis that it puts together these scenarios together and say, okay, you have an infection in your lung. It's essentially when your body just really failed to fight back and it just kind of got overrun. Interestingly, interesting that you say that because the truth of the matter is, is pneumonia in essence is an inflammation of the lungs, right? But the, the usual causation is a infection when we call a pneumonia, right? Cause mm. there's a designation, designation pneumonitis. Cause everything in pneumonitis, if you Never were to, heard of that. if you were to say uh, inflammation of anything in the body, it would be an itis, right? Like Arthritis, okay. you know what I yeah. mean? Like, so pneumonitis can happen when your lungs are inflamed. You know, some, you know, sometimes you've ever had the, the water, water go down the wrong tube. Yeah, you know, jump, absolutely. <coughs> you know, Did it today. You can get an aspiration pneumonitis. No, the lungs do not like things that don't belong there because it's the only open organ to the world. It's constantly taking mm. in pathogens. So it has to have a pretty strong defense system. So the, you know, the on the ready defense in the lungs is like, so to, to reclassify the way I was putting that, mm. when the rest of your upper respiratory system did not fight back adequately mm. such that there's leakage, this mm. is now the lungs in, in this way fighting back and that's how you land on yeah, the body, hypothetically. Because, yeah, because the damage, the da like the way, the way when you feel shitty, when you have an infection, it's usually from the, the, the battle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like not the, you know, not often the, the bacteria is doing the damage or the virus is doing the damage, but the battle itself is what causes you to have the, this inflammatory response. In fact, if you've heard the term sepsis, or I septic have heard shock. of that. Yeah. So people say I went septic. Yeah. Yeah. So in essence, what septic is is SIRS, which is uh, sudden in inflammatory. <laughs> I forgot the acronym. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll look it up. What, what's, the, what's the letters? Uh, S I R S. Um, S I R S. That's just because I'm on a podcast and I'm nervous. It's all good. Uh, it's all good. You're doing great. Um, and the, uh, so, it, you know. Systemic inflammatory, inflammatory response, response syndrome. Response syndrome, yes. But then when it's, when you're confident that it's caused by an infectious organism, it's now sepsis, right? And basically, mm. the, the, the SIRS, which is things like fast heart rate, fast breathing rate, fever, elevated white blood cell count, um, evidence of lack of tissue perfusion, not getting oxygen to your tissues, not getting nutrients to your tissues, et cetera. 
is from the fight, from the inflammation, like the body's in like inflamed, right? You know, so basically, uh, you know, your immune system is like the Avengers, and even if they take out the 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 invading organism, they they're still going to be like the you know the guy that comes and goes, dude, you fucking blew the whole city up. You know what I mean? Like, what what happened here? You know? Yeah. So that's basically that inflammation that happens, and that was part of the that was part of the COVID pneumonia thing is that like this inflammation was so profound. The virus itself was causing serious damage at the level of the little air sacs in the lungs. Plus it was causing baby blood clots. So the, all these little thrombi everywhere in these people's lungs, scarring and, fi- and scar tissue that's forming from the constant turnover of like, hey, that, that hole that just the virus just ate in there. I got to patch it up with some, you know, patch it up with some scar tissue. So there was really bad inflammation, um, and and that's the for the most part people couldn't handle it. So we got into this talking about the whole concept of paying your dues and, and <laughs> being kicked kicked in the ass on the way up. <laughs> yeah. I do want to come back to that. Let's go. But yeah, we're deep on. on this right now, okay. so I want to. I, I don't want to like get off it and then have to like circle back around and everything. You know, to me, I think it's more important than ever to have the conversation around the medical field specifically yeah. like how everything went with covid yeah. because it's impossible to not pay attention to the camps that mm. you see yeah. online yeah. and the camps who get attention yeah. are the extremes yeah. and i can imagine i'm just a douchebag podcaster you're a doctor this this kind of thing has to be just absolutely brain damaging to you listening to yeah. people who are frankly all wrong right yeah it's it's it, so Let's start off by saying morale's certainly not at an all-time high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, you know, I think that, um, first of all, you know, the sort of – the credit has to be given to um, nurses, respiratory therapists, and all of these sort of right. – the people that are constantly in the rooms with these people who are carrying a deadly pathogen in their bodies and are trying – that pathogen is actively trying to expel itself and go get you, you know? So – Yes, it was. It's hard to, to go do the job and then have you know the world outside talking about it um, in a way that you know to be, frankly, mostly yeah, mostly untrue or at least speculative at the time. Yes. You know, yes. um, I think you know. But the other thing is, is that like you know when you're a clinical when you're a clinical physician, right, and you're not a researcher. Like I'm in there, you know, doing you know their trials are going on at this at the time. But like I'm a I'm a frontline like guy. I don't I don't get the I hear what works from the dudes and chicks at the top. You know what I mean? Like they're the ones what do running you mean by at the top? They're running like the people who are at the academic centers, the big institutions who are running the trials going like this medication, we're going to try this medication in combination with this. We're going to see how those people do. And then we're going to take that information and we're going to write a paper about it. All, All right. right. So he, so here's a good question then mm-hmm. on this. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm-hmm. The camps that I was referring to are pretty obvious, but just for people listening yeah. to make sure they know where I stand mm-hmm. with all this. The camps I'm referring to are the camps of people that formed probably within – as early started within a month of this thing hitting. Yes. And that was either the people who were like, this is literally not real, right. which that blew my mind right. that people could think that, right. but okay. And then the people who were like 20% of everyone's dying, Yes, which also we saw that was not going to be the right. case. This was you not know. the stand by Stephen King. Right. Exactly. Right. So you're talking about it where now you have a job to do where you control what's right in front of you, Mm -hmm. right? You're a doctor. You're not, you're not running the business. You're not in there doing all the tests at the top from academia and things like that. No. But we've seen a lack of a a scary lack of transparency and then also public trust as a result where now anytime doctors bring up testing on anything yes people immediately go oh it's probably some people not a lot of people but some people do oh it's probably bullshit yeah whereas what it sounds to me talking with doctors like you and guys who were there is that forget the whole vaccine and all that stuff like when you guys were trying to figure out just ways to save your patients yeah the people who are running a lot of these studies it's not some fucking conspiracy where you know what i mean like they're trying to save people too no i i mean are the people that are running the trials want to be the response? Like, do they want the pat on the back and the name on the paper that figured out how to do it? Yeah. Yeah. And fucking, I want them to have that ego. Good. If whatever drives them, I don't give a shit, but come up with the right answer. If it works. Yeah. And they're not like, I, I just don't see how, you know, any, like, you know, like, you know, take ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Like there's no doctor who was not early on excited when you hear 
that a very sort of like, you know, medication that's being used for certain things for a long time has this other property potentially. And then you read it and you go, oh, that study seems a little flawed. And then you got a medical student who like, who like ter- determines that the paper is like a total farce. And then you look at like what it did. It's like, okay, in the dish, in a Petri dish, right? Or whatever, you know, the, the, the controlled situation, the in, in vitro situation, not in, a, in an animal model. It had some ability to prevent the virus from making copies of itself. Awesome. That'd be great. Turns out you needed like 120 times the lethal dose for it to yeah. be like truly effective. Now, why do you think people here, – here's what I want to know then. Why did people, in your opinion, latch on to stuff like that so heavily? I Listen, I understand that there – and we can talk about different – overshooting the expectations yeah, yeah, that happen. Yeah. And I fully understand that with people. And I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm not going to lecture people on any of that. I, mm. I want people to do what they want to do. But like you saw people form teams around things yeah. like ivermectin. Yeah. And it's like these people, you know, including myself, by the way, we don't sit here and read medical documents all the time. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm no doctor. They're no doctor. And yet it's like, Oh, ivermectin must work. Like what, why, what led us to the point where that became like, you know, your social media status. I think, well, it's, you know, it's, you know, what's ins- you know what the answer to that question is actually, it's pretty, it's so nuanced, but there's a, have you ever seen the movie Contagion with it's Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow? I've never seen it, okay. but I know what you're talking I about. I really want you to watch that movie. It's, okay. this isn't like a net, like, oh, Julian, you got to check this Netflix. And you're like, yeah, sure I will. And then you never, it, never pay you attention. You want me to watch it. Okay. Because this movie came out a while before COVID-19, the pandemic, and it's unbelievable, the parallels. Like so? unbelievable. So during the movie, um, and spoiler alert for the for the for the folks who haven't seen it. Spoil away, baby. Jude Law's character um, is a like you know sort of like fringe journalist. Okay, mm. catches the 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 disease and then cures himself with this uh, homeopathic agent called Forsythia. Puts it on social media and goes, "The government's lying to you. The vaccine's a farce. You know this is, Forsythia works." And then you mm. see lines at pharmacies where they're like, we're running out of forsythia. And people are literally beating the shit out of each other for that last dose of forsythia. And forsythia did not work. And I think that there's like, um, you know, there's an all-time high of distrust of the medical field. And the medical field has done some gnarly shit to the human population over a long time. And there have been some bad actors, and there are still some bad actors, mm. just like every other field. Yes, The stakes are really high. I get that. You know, so when you have like, you know, doctors or pharmaceutical, whoever doing things that are unethical in the name of a profit, the stakes, these are people's lives. So I can understand how people, you know, but they're, but that whole sort of like, I want to get on the team Mm. that is calling it, it, that is like, that is of the belief that this is a lie. Just, I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand how, you know, anybody could like, you know. Like I, I, li- I, I like when my questions, ask, my patients ask me questions about why they, you know, I'm a huge why guy. Why, why, mm. why, 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 why do you want me to do that? Why do you want me to do that? That's key. Uh, it's why is the most important question anybody could ask about anything that's ever been done. Why? Yeah. Because if you don't understand why, then all you're doing is just blindly trusting somebody or blindly distrusting somebody. But if you under, if you ask the why, that's a great question. Then I can tell you why. And then if you believe me, great. And if you don't, then I don't know what I can do for you. But... With that being said, I don't understand why you would believe that I would walk into your room when you can't breathe and not give you something that would save your life. Mm. And then I could go home and sleep at night. I think that's a- That would make me a mass murderer. Listen, I- I hear you. You know? I, I, of course I agree. Right? It's, it's wild to think about, especially when you're talking about like guys who have- long-term relationships with their patients and everything. Right. Like suddenly they're right. going to start hurting them. Right. It's like, oh, you know, people got programmed. Yeah. That's not what happened. Yeah. I think the issue becomes where certain people could have anecdotal evidence yes. that is also, by the way... It's a great point. It might work. It's a great point. Maybe. It's a but, great point. But also, yes. what if it's it's it's... A coincidence, you yeah. know, a correlation, not causation yes. to something. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of that where people, I feel like, cherry pick some things. And I'm not, again, like I'm not sitting here going, oh, you know, do whatever all these, 
pharma companies tell you to do or or do whatever no, you know right. the people on TV no. tell you to do. In fact, you know, I, I think trust is an all time low. In that's a lot why of that. the that's why the question why is so important. But the like, doctors, that's what I'm getting at. I just yeah, like I don't I don't know. I don't I think I think this goes back to what I said about me waiting to hear what the what the guidelines are on a thing because I'm not I'm not in the laboratory. I'm on the you know I'm I'm actually seeing the patients and sort of giving them you know what the treatments are. So perhaps you know perhaps maybe there's there's some level of like. Hey, you the the do, the clinicians are not being told the right answer, right? So they're not they don't even know that they're. But any clinician worth their salt is going to go. Does ivermectin work? Like let's let's look let's look into that. Let's see, you know. And then when, you know, when you read when you do your due diligence and you read the medical literature that supports or refutes, and you say no, no, it it indeed does not. It may have helped a couple. May, may, no, 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 that's a lie. Right? There may have been a couple of people who got better. Right, did other things too, possibly. but that's what I said. The studies were shitty because it's like how many how many people were only on ivermectin were not on dexamethasone, which was the only proven treatment. Remdesivir, dexamethasone, dexamethasone was indicated in somebody who was hypoxic, meaning they had an, a blood oxygen. Dexamethasone. Oxygen. That's a steroid. Okay. Right. I don't know if I'm familiar with that. So it's a steroid. It's an IV steroid that was um, given if a patient was indeed had a, like a blood oxygen saturation below a certain amount. It was proven to be um, uh, to be effective. And not for everybody, but it did help. Some that's why when you say blood, just real fast. I'm sorry, I gotta yeah. clarify to make sorry. sure everyone's following. Sorry, but this, such a <laughs> shitty no, no, guest. no. You're you're the you're the expert here. I gotta make sure the terminology we're following. When you say blood uh, oxygen level, yes, saturation. Though, yeah. What do you mean by that? You want at any given time to have um, your ox your blood saturated with ninety percent or more of oxygen, okay. right? Below that, okay. Um, is a condition called hypoxia or in the blood hypoxemia, which um, in, would be indicative of you not getting enough blood uh, uh, oxygen delivered to your tissues. Got it. So it's not necessarily like, oh, something else replaced it. It's just the fact that you literally have to have a system that flows yeah. for a bloodstream. Yeah. And if you're not being able to suck in the air... Yeah, so there's – right, and, that, and 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 figuring out why somebody's hypoxic is is a very interesting sort of path. It's like, okay, is it the fact that they're not getting it into their lungs and then – or is it their ability to pass it from the air in their lungs to the bloodstream or is it then something wrong with the blood delivery system? And that's that's – that's the coolest fucking thing about medicine is like what – you know, you see what's wrong and you go, why? <laughs> and yeah. you figure it out and you get – you know what I mean? Like and that's – that's the coolest thing I think about being a doctor. It's like when you kind of like when you have a physiological problem and you go, okay, it could be it could be one of these eight things, and then there's some evidence to point to this one, evidence to point to that one, etc. And then you kind of come up with it with a story. But medicine is also the shittiest science because anywhere you go on the planet Earth, for you know, within a degree of reason, gr the acceleration due to gravity is nine point eight meters per second squared. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, one blood pressure medication may work for you and not for me makes no sense to a person who is a pure science scientist because they go, well, both of the systems that the, you know, this person is operating under should, you know what I mean? So that's, that's why, that's why this anecdotal stuff is, is kind of powerful, but also dangerous because mm. medical studies require a certain number of people in order to be st statistically significant and show proof of efficacy. I think another issue that, I don't know if the word is issue there, I don't know if that's what I'm looking for, but a psychological aspect of this that has had me very interested for Ooh, a behavior, long time, yes. just looking at society, mm -hmm. is the reverse psychology on purpose mm. possibility. Go ahead. I, again, I don't know, but... Something like the ivermectin, where you as a doctor and plenty of other doctors mm -hmm. could say, I think you said it, it could be 120 times lethal dose to be effective or something yes, like that. Whatever I, it is. I don't remember what the exact is. number was. But, but yeah. it's something that would be outside the realm of what you would be able to do. Right. And you may look at that and say the evidence is so strong that that's the case that, yeah, we don't really want to see people thinking that they should take this, mm -hmm. right? When you then can profit off of that, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the media mm -hmm. now. Once and again, watch Contagion, please. My gosh, I'm gonna, ha I'm you gotta gonna do have it. to you do that do it. based on what you're Jude telling. Jude Law's me. character is the most important character in the whole. The and whole you movie. said he's a fringe journalist in there, so that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So, like, you look at CNN, mm -hmm. and one of the things that they did, and this this wasn't just them. I think they were the people that started this, though. So I'm pointing them out. Mm -hmm. Was like when Rogan got 
COVID, and he, by the way, did a whole bunch of things. Yes. One of the things happened to be some form of ivermectin, yes. whatever. When he said that, they then made sure to Angered. go out. They angered everyone because they said he used a horse to worm right. and everything instead of recognizing that it is an actual drug. That, In, very much. Yes. It that is human an, beings is an use anti- for, for yes. other things, yes. right? So, so let's, can I, can they I tried step to in? Piss, yes. They tried to piss people off is my point. It feels that way. A hundred percent because I really want to talk about what you just said about what CNN did to sort of, you know, to, to, to how, yeah. how they got a headline there, mm-hmm. right? Ivermectin is indeed a horse to wormer, but it was it's been recognized for for many years as an antiparasitic drug that is a it attacks chloride gated neuron uh, ion channels in the in neurons meaning so it its job is to any medicine that you take that is going to attack another organism that has invaded your body has to do two things it has to kill the organism that has attacked you and not kill you right so antibiotics work by figuring out what's the difference between that bacteria and you on a cellular level and then destroying that thing, right? So ivermectin works by, you know, uh, destroying the nervous system, central nervous system of these parasites, these worms, right? And then, and but not, not doing that to the animal, right? Um, so it is, it is appropriate to call it a horse dewormer, but it's inappropriate to leave out the fact that it's used to treat humans. Correct. And it has been for many years. They're deleting by, they're it's, deleting it's, by default. It's literally, in my opinion, um, it is, is deception by, yes. but what's the, what's the term deceptive when you, when you like with, withhold information, it's deceptive, dude. I know what you're thinking. It's deceptive. Of, I can't think of the word. It's deceptive. I don't think it, it didn't help Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's in amazing shape. Yeah. The guy can kick like a hole in your wall. Yes. And there's nothing scientific about the way Joe Rogan got treated because when you do more than one, when you change more than one variable in any situation, how could you ever prove what it, what what was, what it was exactly. So when you talk about, you use that gravity example, what is it again? 9.8 meters per second squared. I got a C in physics. So sorry. You're going to have to forget me here. Not smart enough to be a physicist. I like physics though. It's awesome. I'm just not that great at it. Yeah, it's awesome. So- the thing about that is you're talking not to say – don't mishear me here. Not to say the universe is not a very complex thing. It is. Yeah. But you're talking about one giant mass mm-hmm. within a system that has an overall level of variables as to how it works, like yes. the solar system, yes. right? If you're a small speck as mm-hmm. a human being, like a micro of a micro of a micro of a micro speck – yeah. The chances that a seven foot five guy who's three hundred pounds versus a five foot four woman who's a hundred pounds yeah. soaking wet yeah. are going to have a difference in their pooling gravity, it's like mathematically not possible. Mm-hmm. However, when you are now looking at an individual human's body, yes, and you know we all have we're supposed to have ninety eight point six percent temperature, but what what are all the variables coming in? What we breathe every day, where we live, who we're around, so what our mental's like, yep. what we put in our mouth, yes. what we drink or don't drink, all Absolutely. these different things. There, there's a, there's, I mean, I think there's thirty to 50,000 just decision points in a day, which by the way is using your brain and therefore using energy and things like that. Decision there's fatigue. All, there's all these different variables that occur in billions, trillions of iterations throughout the day. Yeah. So when you're talking about like, oh, as a scientist, it shouldn't make sense that one thing affects someone else differently. In my opinion, it should make sense because you're dealing with di- you're dealing with different planets, right? But, yeah, and that and that's a great that's a great uh, analogy that the you know the the system inside the human body it carries as many variables probably as the universe does on that you know sort of like on a on a on an exponential scale, um, and and the, the key thing here is like when you're performing a scientific experiment, which a medical study is, you want to isolate. One changeable factor. That's the scientific method. Yes. Isolate one changeable factor. So when you do pool patients together, you're trying to figure out, hey, can we get the most people the same age, the same yes. area they live in, the same, you know, can, can we make them look the same the most so that when we try this variable to change this one variable on them, either the removal or addition of, a, of, a, of something, then we can measure the change. And even that, you still, if you could get, as a scientist, right? Yeah. With your hat oh, on I'm there. I'm not a scientist, but. but yeah, yeah, but, but I'm that. saying like, it, it, doctors are medical scientists, so to speak, quote unquote. Mm. I'm using a broad term. But as someone who's like thinking about this and yeah. in the field, yeah. if you could get 12 iterations of a study versus two, you want the 12 every yeah. single time. Yeah. 
the more the like, like well, it doesn't even make sense the first time a lot. Being able to reproduce something is very much the the tenant like the basis of, basis of science. Like, and you in order to prove a theory, somebody else has to be able to take what you did and reproduce it, like without you around. Yes. Right. So I have to be able to take ivermectin and give it to my patients and have to see the majority of them improve if they otherwise wouldn't have. And here's an, here's another thing then you're, you're, you're going right along here. I like this. Like you're, you're picking at all the different things that I wanted to talk with you about, but in order to learn if something works or not, you do have to test it on people. That's why we have trials. That's why we figure things out. Yes. Another part of another layer of that psychological deletion that we were talking about, the deception, all these different words, is that we have we have basically removed the ability to do that because we cancel medical ideas in public society outside of just medicine, yeah. right? Like among the douchebags like yeah. me, just sitting around and talking, mm. right? We cancel it based on oh no, so-and-so brought that up, so we're not going to look at that. Or that person in the medical field is thinking it, they've thought this before, so we're not even going to consider it. And to me, the whole point of science, right, is to challenge ideas. You are constantly trying to correct or fix or find a new way. And so in order to do that, it's like anything else. You have to find failure too. Yeah. I'm not saying, uh, not to extrapolate, it, Doc, but I'm not saying, hey, let's go give you know hydroxychloroquine to 100 million people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying like on a small test basis, why are we not allowing to see these results in the public so that people can at least learn? Like, oh, ivermectin doesn't work. Yeah, here's why. So nothing to hide. Yes, I think, um, I think that uh, you know, failure in science is not a bad word. Right, because when something, when when a when an idea fails in a test, you have now eliminated that from the, like, okay, we don't have to test that again. You know what I mean? Like that's you know the remain it, the answer must now lie with the remainder of ideas. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, I do think that they, you know, they they did. They, there was enough. There was enough people who got me- the, dosed with those medications. You know what I mean? To to recognize that there wasn't any. You know what I mean? Because I'll tell you right now. How many studies did you see with that? I, I would be lying to you if I told you that I, I I could come up with, I saw what, you know, like what basically are like meta-analyses, which are, are studies that kind of collect other smaller studies, bring them together, see how relatable they are, and then Shows produce a bigger, yeah, they produce Got like it. a bigger result. They'll take like, hey, you know, these 12 centers or, you know, groups did the, and then we, we put them together. We try to line up the variables as close as we possibly can and then spit out a, a bigger a f- more, 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 more scientifically powerful study. Do you what? Just quick question, yeah. a, as a clarifier. Mm-hmm. Do you worry sometimes about, especially if it's something that's become politicized, about the accuracy on some of these versus not saying again that people are just going in there and cooking, mm-hmm. but they're trying to get to an intended result. So maybe they they conduct the studies on people who are less likely mm-hmm. to respond or things like that. Is that at least a thought, just as like a little challenge point in your head? <sighs> I think that um, I think that there are a ton of studies being done on a daily basis with populations that are pre-selected to give them the best opportunity to prove whether, whatever they're trying to prove. Mm. With that being said, um, that's what the peer review system is for, and the peer review system is basically like an when you when you write a paper when you when you try to prove something from a study, other people that are independent of you have to review it and and give you feedback on it. And then once it's reviewed, then it can be published. And certain journals are certainly not as effective or as, you know, powerful or impactful or or even, you know, tr- as trustworthy as ser- some. But, you know, there are some that are just the holy grail. Like when the New England Journal of Medicine says something, you listen because it's been reviewed. Why? It's been reviewed by the the best minds that we have without, with, with, with hopefully without any bias, but there's always going to be bias. But I understand what you're saying. You're asking me if, if, you know, you try to cherry pick, uh, situations where your idea is going to be proven. Of course, everybody wants them. Everybody wants to be right, but it has to, in order for it to get re, like real, real capture, it has to have more impact than that. It can't just survive your small preselected group. It has to, it has to be extrapolated 
to the to a larger group or whatever. You know what I mean? So the process with which pay, with, with which scientific or medical ideas are taken and put into use is is a little bit more rigorous than you know a study with like 500 patients that so that showed that this thing did this. It's like okay, we'll look at that and then we'll do it amongst 5,000 or 500,000. And if it works there, then we'll start to make that a guideline. Mm. You know what I mean? So yeah, I think I think there's certainly. I don't know, you got 20, 30 years to unpack what happened here, man. Because I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We got a long time to figure out what happened here. And there will be people that will be looking at this from with so many different pairs of glasses on. Um, but all I can say is this. I got to tell you, like my, I wouldn't have been able to, re- I would not have been able to rest my head on any given day after coming home and pronouncing two or three people dead, knowing that like all I had to do was give them this like one thing. And I was like, right. fuck that, I'm too principled. I this believe is, my camp. This is what I mean, man. Like my pe- the people that voted for the guy that I voted for so that I can't give them that. So they're yeah. dead now, but like I'm okay with that. Like no fucking way. See, you're, you're <laughs> you know? a face no on way. camera no way. as a doctor no way. putting behind it. This is what we need yeah. more of. No way. Like, Be- I, there's pe- Do you understand though? Yeah. There are people who legitimately, they think that like doctors are, are just completely brainwashed. I, 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 I understand. Like Brain- all doctors. Right. I understand that like when an idea is seated so powerfully in your head that you, th- th- that's the, that's the inherent issue here is like, th- there is no level of proof that, you know, there's no level of proof that will make somebody change their thought process at this point for some of these things. They're just dug in, man. They have like, they're dying the wool, you know, but like as somebody who's like, you know, somebody's dying in the middle of the night in the ICU, like, th- like take COVID out of the equation. Somebody's in the intensive care unit in the middle of the night and they're, 50 something years old and their wife's out in the hallway crying and like i'm gonna throw shit at them that i have no idea was gonna is gonna work sometimes if i run out of ideas i'm calling people hey what do you come you know take a look we're trying everything we can yeah. you know what i mean like there's i just don't i just don't see a scenario where the, like i don't ever want that to large, stop either i don't just i just don't see a scenario on a large scale where people would be like oh this thing doesn't um i can think i kick my headphones out Oh, sorry. Yeah, just hit this. You see that middle thing right there? Mm. You just go like that. Okay, and cool. And you go right back in. There's there no scenario which I think that I think uh you know, I think a large group of doctors would have let this many people die. That's what I'm saying. I just don't. Now let let's go back to the beginning then. Yeah. On, on that point, I actually think that doctors did a great job overall. Just looking at the general population. Hmm readjusting okay at the beginning obviously i don't think anyone did a great job because no one knew what they were dealing with however no what you saw is about maybe it was quarantine started roughly like march 13th that friday Mm -hmm. up uh, up in uh new jersey and new Mm -hmm. york so then it got to the rest of america by monday or whatever maybe six to ten weeks out of that what you started to hear about, and I'd love to get your perspective because I'm not on the inside, was that doctors were figuring out that, oh, respirators are not a way to go. Mm. Let's stop that because mm. we're making people train themselves not to breathe on mm. their own and they never get off them. Mm. And then they also started figuring out at least like some things that could help mitigate whether it was, and correct me if I'm wrong here, there was like some people using remdesivir mm-hmm. or stuff like that. And you started to see at least, you know, they talk about like the flattening of the curve. You saw the the gravity of it of mm-hmm. deaths mm-hmm. every day mm-hmm. in may 2020 yeah. start to dissipate yeah. overall mm-hmm. and so i think like you know it's easy to just boil it down to those things i just said yeah. but what it like take me into the hospital when you were there what were you guys when did you guys have eureka moments and what when did you start to feel like there was certain a, things changed the game there was a study the like the new the data from new york started to come down and i don't remember, like like I, I feel like the whole thing's been such a blur that I, I will never be able to be right on like a month or a year, whatever. It's okay. But um, we'll be broad. Sorry. There was like a new, there was a, there was some information from New York that came out and said that like X amount of patients, like ninety percent of patients who went on a ventilator died, mm-hmm. and then so that you know that doesn't give you an answer. That just gives you a, a data piece, a piece of data, and you go, well, okay, well, what did that mean that they were done for anyway? Was there some you know, was there some pressure trauma? Like when you go when you go on a a ventilator, right? You have to, you're, there's, there's a million little variables to adjust on the ventilator, right? How much oxygen to deliver, um, how much, how, how much air at any given time, how often to deliver that air. Are you going to let the patient draw the air on their own or is the machine going to force it? 
you know what I mean? And then how much pressure are you going to deliver? So there's like, the, there's this, this amazing fluid dynamic physiology and physics that are involved in mechanical ventilation. Um, what, for people out there listening, just to give a visual, because I feel like mm-hmm. we don't do this enough. We just yeah. put these words out there. Sure. When we say someone's going on a ventilator, mm-hmm. can you walk people through what happens? Okay. So um, typically what will happen is a patient will be in a condition that they we believe either by looking at them or by some data points that they are not adequately adequately breathing on their own. And that could mean that they're not bringing in, they're not exchanging gases in their lungs or they're not like driving the, the, they're not breathing. Like, you know, like there's either a gas exchange issue inside the lung where they're, they're trying to breathe, but they, it doesn't matter or they can't, or they're not trying to breathe because their mental status is too, you know, on the decline. And their, their blood saturation levels are insanely low. Every, yeah. So, right. Or, or, or we think maybe there's going to be, there's an impending collapse and we kind of get ahead of it, right. Where they're going to they're going to go into what a respiratory might, arrest. What might make you think that? Like things like the saturation level? Saturation. Or if somebody's, re, if like, for instance, if somebody has really bad, like, emphysema or something like that, and right. they're having a, yeah. an exacerbation and they start to they start to have a difficult time breathing, there's only certain, there, you know, breathing is a relatively passive process, right? So you don't pull in air. You, air falls into your lungs because what happens is your diaphragm creates a larger area inside your chest, which means that you're, you're in the air inside your chest is now at lower pressure than the air outside your chest. Mm. And all fluids will go from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure. Air is a fluid. So mm-hmm. when you create this lower pressure system inside your chest, air will fall into your lungs and that's breathing. Then you create a higher pressure environment in your chest by your diaphragm going up, your lungs kind of compress. And now we have the reverse process. When that system is flawed because either the airways are smaller because you have an asthma attack or whatever is going on that that's not working that way, you will use small muscles. We call them the accessory muscles of breathing in the neck and the chest to sort of help that process. Chest expansion and chest wall mechanics, movement of Mm. the air in and out. Those muscles are not like ready to rock and roll for two or three hours. You know what I mean? Like when somebody's using the, when they're, <laughs> you know what I mean? When they're doing that thing, you know, and you see it and you go, that guy's, that guy's not going to last very long doing that. Mm. Right. And their oxygen starts to plummet or they're breathing like 40 times a minute when they're only supposed to be breathing 15 times a minute. There's just tons of data that you put together and go, that person's either in respiratory failure or pending respiratory. Like they're going to go there. So let's do something. We got to do something. So okay. then you get somebody who's trained to intubate, meaning they are going to be able to take a plastic tube and stick it into their trachea. Now, do they stick it through like they actually make an incision? Not, no. Typic, uh, in, under some circumstances, if there's some like trauma to the face or something like that in an emergency situation, but for the ma- vast majority of the time it's done through the mouth. Got it. Um, if they stay there, if they stay out in a long time, then they'll switch to the neck because okay. then you need to not like have their mouth deal with that, right? There's, like there's too throat. much muscle movement. And there's stuff infl- like that. there's tons of things that are going on in the mouth that you can't just let them have a tube down their throat for, you know, for weeks at a time. So there's yeah. a period of time if they don't, if they don't get off the ventilator right away. So you switch, but in the end, in the, in the acute scenario, like right now you put the tube in, right? You get, you visualize it, you know, old school way would be like to look, you know, now they have these like amazing cameras that you'd like put down there and it can basically be like, you're here, go, you know, like that's your spot, hit it. Um, and then once the tube is in and the airway is secure, they put them on a breathing machine, a ventilator, right? And it just, it manually does all the things you described the body's supposed to do, pull in the air and then releasing. Depending on the That's setting. It. So the ventilators are very, very, very complicated to the point where there's entire fellowships devoted to learning ventilators. And then, so the ventilators can decide, like you can set the ventilator, like I said, to, if the patient is completely unable to trigger breath on their own. Like there's no part of their their body that's going to say, I need a breath right now. You set the ventilator to do it for them. But if the patient can can try, can, like the body wants breath, the ventilator will sense that and give it to them mm. based on how much you at, you tell the ventilator to give. You know what I mean? And how often you do it and with what oxygen se- percentage, et cetera. And certain numbers and settings can cause some damage, you know, too much pressure, not enough, pre- you know, it's like, so... 
But also people, once you put them on this, they're on there for an hour, two hours, three hours a day, a week. Mm. As, as time goes on, all these extra muscles and movements that you talked about that are involved in helping compensate for breathing and mm. stuff like that or are part of the breathing process, mm. they all atrophy because they're just chilling. It's always, always the goal is to safely remove the patient from the vent, from the ventilator as as soon as you can safely i say that safely cuz it's yeah, not the goal it's not the goal to get them off as soon as possible the goal is to get them off when they can tolerate being off at, and how you know, do you tell that that's a great question because they have yet to come up with a app like an a 100% accurate predictive system mm. but there are some guidelines which with with the patient should should meet in order for you to believe that they're ready to be extubated or have the tube removed, they have to be requiring from the ventilator a certain percentage of oxygen or lower. So they need to be on about 50% of, of oxygen or lower because the oxygen in the room air is 21%. So we want to get to 21%, as close to 21% as we can, right? They need to be breathing uh, on their own. So you pause, you take the ventilator and say, pause, Let the, let's see what they do on their own. Right, and you don't take it out. You just just let them go through the, on the machine. Yeah, pause, yeah. pause on the machine. So it's a, called a you know a breathing trial, right? And we see. And how long does that last? Depends on how long they can tolerate it. Like we try to get them. Hey, let's see. Let's see how long they can take to tucker out because then we get a real good idea how long they're going to last. You know. So then there's this thing called the rapid shallow breathing index, meaning like you should not breathe fast and you should not breathe shallow. Mm. So we want you to take good long deep breaths on your own. So if you're not doing that you're probably going to fail extubation, right? Right. You also need to be mentally alert enough to participate in pr the protection of your own airway. I mean, like you need to be able to like keep your airway going and be with it and not be completely and totally zonked out. So you need to be like, you know, with it enough to like, um, you know, breathe on your own and not have things go into your lungs that don't belong there. So the, the, the muscles that protect your airway from swallowing or, you know, just your saliva, every minute of every day, Every time you're not breathing, there's a muscle that closes a flap over your airway yeah. to say, no, just air, please. Everything else, yeah. stay out. If that's not going to work, we can't take the tube out. Mm. So there's a lot of things that give us an idea that you may be ready to come off. And by the way, I am not a pulmonologist. Um, I have good friends that are pulmonologists, and I trained at like, a place where uh, let pulmonology is like, it's, it's, it was really done really well. So that's the only reason why I know this stuff. But I am not a lung doctor. I'm a, just an internal man. I did not take the extra training. But I do do some critical care as part of my job. So ventilators are something I'm very familiar with. I did a lot of ICU time when I was in my residency. But we don't have a 100% prediction, like a uh, way to predict. But we have a good idea. And that's medicine, you know. We, we're never going to be 100% right. But we have a good idea. And most people are going to benefit from what we know already. You know what I mean? Like... So yeah, mechanical ventilation is something you should avoid, but it is often necessary. And then the goal would be to get them back to breathing on their own as soon as possible in a safe fashion when okay. they're ready. All right. Bookmarking for one sec, just where we were going with this about, I was asking you about where, like when a little eureka moment happened mm. or like how that oh, went yes. down and yes. you said it could be, it could have been April or May or whatever. Yeah. But before that, just to clarify one other thing. There was a documentary that creepily enough, sounds a little weird, especially looking at it now, came out on Netflix mm -hmm. right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think it, I think it might have literally been called pandemic. I'm, I'm not sure. It was okay. very weird. But it was, they were tracking flu yeah. around the world. Yeah. And, you know, as you said earlier on, flu has been a problem for a long time and it yeah. does kill people every year. Yeah. When they were, I, I remember there was, there was a scene in there, I think it was in India on a on a emergency room ward where they showed the process of somebody who was put on a ventilator mm -hmm. and the doctor i believe if i'm remembering this correctly so if i'm wrong please tell me people okay. but the doctor was talking about how he needs to be able to breathe on his own because if we let him keep doing this, he's never going to get off it and he's yeah. going to go yeah now this was just the regular flu cuz this was you know way before covid when this was filmed so it sounded to me, based on the fact the guy got off and he wasn't in good shape either, mm -hmm. survived the whole bit, mm -hmm. and this has happened. Mm -hmm. This was something where they, they're able to do this with people. Mm -hmm. Some people don't make it, but mm -hmm. a lot of people do. With COVID, mm -hmm. as you said, it was like 90%, some ridiculous number. Like, literally. Like, I know a guy who made it who was on it for like 56 days, and he had newspaper articles everywhere because right. it was so rare. Right. Why was it with COVID, like, you once they went on, they were done? 
Yeah, I think I think that that that, that question is tough to answer because of the fact that you know um, we I don't know how much the ventilator itself played a role versus the fact that you're like if if you required a ventilator, it meant your lungs were destroyed. Right. So mm. like, I don't, I don't, th I don't know if that's a, it's a question that's, that's easy to answer. Like I mentioned before, I had read, read the, um, some of the autopsy information coming back, looking at the lungs of these people and the lungs were so beat up. Like we're talking, you know, that analogy I said about the Avengers, like, you know, we're talking like they're fighting Ultron in there and the, 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 the your lungs are the, 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 the buildings are just, everything's destroyed. Right. So did it mean that you were already at the end? stage of your lung of your respiratory failure with no recovery right mm. like did you not recover appropriately or did the ventilator contribute to your demise i don't know how easy of a question that is to a to answer it's not i'm sure it's not you know because if you needed a ventilator like you couldn't there, like there's no ethical way to say like well, you know what? let's keep the all like 100 of these guys that can't breathe let's keep them off and see how they do just let, if they peter out, they peter out. Then we'll prove ventilators work. Like that's not something we could ever yeah. do. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think that, um, I think there was probably some level of contribution, but I think if you were, if you required a ventilator, you were probably in bad shape. But we, to your point about the whole atrophying, yeah, like the longer you stay on the vent, like there's a lot of things that, ha that happen. And there's also like other things about being a person lying in a bed doing with no movement getting IVs and all, there's a million things that are bad about being in that shape. Yeah, well, I mean, there's nothing, let's get another thing straight. The longer you're in a hospital, yes. sick, period, yes. Yes. you know, or like, not even just a hospital, like bedridden, Yes. it's, the longer anything goes, it's worse for your body because all the normal things, you get up, you walk downstairs, you, you, you drink water, you, you know, your day starts, you know, you're not doing any of that in The unsung bed. heroes of medicine in the last... <laughs> I don't know, forever are, are physical therapists. They're starting, mm, you know, they, they recognize, agree. they recognize that like an ICU patient who is on, is extremely sedated and on a ventilator. Okay. And like, it's not even com remotely with it. Right. Has 95 IV fluids, all kinds of medicines run. Physical therapist needs to come in and move that person's limbs around as much as yeah. possible because that actually showed benefit to long-term outcomes. Right. So like, movement of any i mean it used to be that you got an operation that the surgeon was like don't move for like 60 days or whatever you know what yeah. i mean like now it's like hey we just lopped off your leg hop around on the other one as soon as you can you know what i mean like yeah it, they're it, really it, aggressive yeah and it's it's important because we are sedent a sedentary lifestyle in general like out they, they take away the critically ill take a person whose job now makes them sit down all day it's really bad for you like really bad. I don't have it. I don't have the study up right now. I can pull it up in a minute, hopefully. But I remember there was, I think it was an amalgamation actually of studies mm. that came out maybe, I feel like this was even before the pandemic, not that that matters, mm -hmm. but where they talked about the, one of the ultimate slow killers of the human race mm. is sitting down. Yes. And the science had to do, and I'm really just trying to recall this right now, but the science had to do with like blood circulation and the the unnaturalness or something of this position that we're literally in right yeah. now. And yeah. because more and more people are doing it, it's actually inhibiting our ability to lengthen lifespan mm. because enough people are getting different health benefits yeah. from being in a seat 12 yeah. hours a day. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I'd like to read that. Right. And I, you know, but I could just imagine right off the bat, the mechanism by which they're discussing is that like, you know, um, if you're, if you're, if you're, if your blood vessels are kinked at certain angles, like, you know, if you're sitting down, you have, you have multiple sets of large blood vessels that are now at 90 degree angles. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or even more acute angles. Yeah. And that is, that adds turbulent blood flow, right? So if you imagine a, a large blood vessel as a tube going straight down that tube, you have laminar flow. Blood is easily moving. But when you, mo when you have like angles, now you have blood bumping up against walls and, you know, things don't move as, as good as they, you know, can. I mean, that's just part of the reason why we get blood clots when you, after a long flight, right? Like no, no movement and non-moving blood is sticky blood. Sticky blood is cloudy blood and cloudy blood is deadly blood. Cloudy blood is deadly blood. Yeah. Like sticky, like your blood, if it's not moving, it's sticking together. That's, that's by, that's by design hmm. because when you bleed, if you didn't have sticky, if your blood wasn't sticky, 
you would n never not bleed. So that's you know we that's how we patch up ourselves. I um, also I, I did just pull this up too, okay. so I want to cite it because I was it. able to get it. So Sitting this is smoking, yeah. this is from the Heart Foundation mm -hmm. on. I was right. It was shortly before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. August 10th, 2019 is sitting the new smoking. Uh, what are you doing as you read this? Having a cup of coffee, taking a break from work, getting ready for bed, blah, 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 blah. Of course, you're sitting down. Most of us have heard the phrase sitting is the new smoking, referring to the growing epidemic of sedentary lifestyles mm -hmm. in the United States. But is this true? Is sitting in a chair that bad for you? We decided to find out the facts. Hmm. Over 25% of American adults sit for more than eight hours a day every day. 44% of those people get little to no exercise. And by the way, people, again, this is August 2019. Extrapolate this after a pandemic that sent everyone home and now has people used to things like remote work. Yes. The average American watches approximately three hours of television a day, most likely sitting down. The average American is active less than 20 minutes every day. 60 to 75 minutes of moderate activity, steady walking can counter the effects of too much sitting. So there are ways to fight back against this, get the blood flow. A 2011 11 studies, this is years ago, documented 800,000 people. I like that number. It's a big number. That's and, the important size that when we talk about like the, when that's a, when you have that many people, you listen to the results. Yes. All right. So 800,000 people of their sitting habits. The study found that people who sit the most compared to people who sit the least have a greater risk of disease and death. 112% increased risk of, di of diabetes, 147% increased risk of cardiovascular events like heart attack and stroke, 90% increased risk of death from cardiovascular events, and 49% increased risk of death from any cause. You guys can Google this by checking the Heart Foundation and Googling with it is smoking the new sitting and you'll see the article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But like right away, by the way, Way, doc here's a good example yeah. a question i would have is of that study you yeah. see these numbers they yeah. make a ton of sense yeah. how many of those people were already correlated to sitting because for other reasons they're already way out of shape right like yeah. someone is already quote right. unquote obese right. and so naturally they sit more right this is inherently the like sort of domino effect that all you know what i mean everything begets everything else right so it you know i think and that i think that is the problem the most difficult and i you know People are watching this on YouTube. They're looking at me. They go, how could this guy ever tell me anything about like weight loss or anything? Because, you know, I'm battling my weight my whole life. I was 330 pounds of my heaviest. Holy shit. What are you now? You're a lot like, less than that. I want to tell you 240 and change. So, um, All right, 90 pounds down. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, it's harder to get. It's harder to do any of the things that are Bennett, like would give you the anti of this when you're already getting bigger. You yes. know what I mean? Like. You watch a show like My 600 Pound Life, you go, how the fuck do you get to that point? And <laughs> I want to say like Fat Bastard from Austin Powers said it best. He's like... If you're looking to search the web privately and not have all these websites track you when you leave, check out my friends over at Privato VPN. Privato is the VPN company that gives you all the privacy without losing any of the speed. And that's why I love it so much. I can use it on both of my devices, my computer and my phone at the same time. And if you have up to 10 different devices, you can use it on all 10 at the same time, full service, because that's the Privato way. So use that link in my description for Privato and you will see my landing page with the company and there will be a plan there for $4.99 a month. It is the same one I use. You're going to love it. So check it out and let me know what you think. I eat because I'm fat. I'm fat and I'm fat because I eat. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, like, like you're already... Is that a line from that? Yeah. I remember like the when, Czech when, one. When, I when, ate because I'm unhappy and I'm unhappy it's because a, and I it, ate. And I guess Mike Myers wrote both of those lines. Yeah, right? that's so, true. Fuck. You know, um, got that. but like, you know, when, when, when you're not moving... And you're, you know, you're sort of, you know, you're, you're, it's inertia, dude. Like, you know, uh, things don't want to move if they're at rest and the humans are no different. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, if you're already sitting a little and you start to develop a little bit of weight gain and you start to develop a little bit of like muscle loss and a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of that, you're going to do more of it mm. by virtue of how you feel. And then you're going to be in the 112, 12% increased risk of de developing right. diabetes. Right. So, you know sort of movement i think there's two things right now um that i think are the both toughest thing to do that have the greatest benefit that we are have a difficult time doing especially as americans is moving and eating less <laughs> not eating less eating less often okay mm. eating less often um you know i'm i'm like big into the the reading about, um, you know, you said longevity is something you mentioned, right? You know, um, moving around and being physically active is, is huge. And then like we eat too often. 
you know? Yeah, I've been I've been an intermittent faster for about four years Good now. Good for you. And it is, in my opinion, at this point, very natural. Good. I have I have to watch because of my circumstances at the moment, not to go all the way into that and bore people, but I have to watch Looking not eating card. enough, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I will get busy yeah. working because I went from, for eight straight years, mm-hmm. I worked out six to seven days a week. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Lifting. And then I did cardio most of those days too. Yeah. And I was nuts about it. Mm-hmm. I trained very, very hard because mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. Yeah. And for a few different reasons, I have not health wise been able to do that. Right. And I've been building this thing yeah. by, you know, coincidence Time. there, which is not, that was not planned. That's just how it's worked out. But the difference now, not working out nearly as much and not being able to, yeah. you know, my body was used to demanding calories all the time. Mm. You know, I, even when I was an intermittent faster, I needed to pound four or 5,000 calories a day mm. because I was, you know, I was, I lifted Use for it. an hour a day minimum. You know, I boxed yeah. the whole nine. Yeah. Now, not doing that, I'll be sitting here sometimes, by the way, in a studio sitting down and my sleep schedule is weird. I go to bed at like 5 a.m. I'm mm. up at like 11, 11.30. But like, you know, it'll be 5.30. I'll be like, oh, shit. I have to eat. I forgot oh. to eat. <laughs> and that, in my opinion, you got to be careful with that because it can fuck you up the other yeah. way. Because yeah. then your body like gets used to like, it's almost like you're starving yourself a little yeah. bit. But for people who have like a good balanced life, like I'd like to have again at some point here, <laughs> you know, to me, I got very, because I did this when I didn't have this schedule, I got very used to feeling that form of you you're almost operating on like free energy throughout the morning yeah and then when you eat you actually eat in like decent portions and you feel more it's hard to explain you feel more balanced yeah. you feel you feel clearer headed your body doesn't just store and let it sit in your stomach as much it starts using it fast so it's all this is all extremely spot on what you feel, and it's explained very easily by the biochemistry of of eating and processing the the food. And I, you know, breakfast is a meal that is by definition breaking a fast, right? Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that that fast is just not long enough for most people. Um, you know, we are, you know, um, everybody. I actually always use this point, like, you know, when people are like, oh, you know, this is what we did when we were, you know, cavemen or whatever. And I go, well, we only lived till about 30 something. We were yeah. But I think that was, had a lot to do with like, you know, lions, and tigers and bears, oh my, plus the ability to not fight off infections. And there's a lot of reasons why. What are why they we, eating? What's what, that? What are they eating too? Right. You think they're eating McDonald's? Right. <laughs> you know what I That's mean? That's the point. The point is, is that, and they ate and our bodies are set up to, when you're out there early man and you come across like a dead yak or some shit you eat the whole th- like even, even if you're full you're like oh, fucking, i gotta i gotta eat i gotta yeah. eat. i don't know when i'm gonna see another one of these right yeah. and your brain rewards you with dopamine and insulin spikes and insulin is a storage hormone insulin says insulin is field mouse not cricket if insulin goes winter's coming we need to keep this and store it as fat like we need to put this in, in the, use what you need to right now, but everything else needs to get stored. Um, and that's a great system for when food and eating only happens once a day, once every three days, whatever it is that you, you know, you find yourself, the scenario you find yourself in is early human. Now, when food is literally every, th- everywhere, I mean, you literally go on your phone and and an hour later, somebody will drop off at your door and you never have to lock eyes with them. Yeah. We'll drop off a meal at your door any time of the day. And your insulin levels are constantly up. And there's, when you fast, there are, there are things that happen on a cellular level, even like a, like a smaller level than that on a, on a molecular level that are longevity based, that are ener- like that are protective of your of, against cellular damage there's i mean google this shit when you have time like mtor which is the mammalian mtor which is the mammalian target of rapamycin it's a signaling pathway that isn't seems to be important when you're younger and growing right so it's like cell proliferation like let's make more cells let's do you know let's build things you know then it gets to a point where you're like, yeah, I got an, I got a lot of, I got a lot of stuff in my body. I don't need more stuff. But if you're eating constantly, you're taking in new proteins, you're storing fat, 
your insulin levels are always high. You're becoming, you know, the boy who cried wolf. Excess. It's excess all yeah. the time. When you fast, mTOR is go, uh, activity goes down. And then you start to do things like recycle your own, like old beat up cells. Right. Autophagy and program cell death. What is the optimal length? I don't remember. I should know this. But you mentioned a few minutes ago that like we break the fast too soon mm. with breakfast. So mm. maybe someone eats dinner at eight o'clock mm -hmm. and then they're having breakfast at 630 or mm. seven. Or let's even say they're having breakfast at 8 a.m. That's mm -hmm. 12 hours. Is it like... Like the regular intermittent fast is 16-8. I've always been like a 17-7 or 18-6 guy. But like, is it literally like 16 hours where it's optimal so that that extra four hours is your body getting rid of excess? I don't think that's a question. I, I, I think, hmm. So I think the optimal one is the one that works best for you because um, there are a lot of flavors to this. You, know, you can, once again, you, you can go on YouTube. There's a lot of people with, sharing their anecdotal stories back to the anecdote versus scientific evidence thing but there's some people that will like you know do eat whatever they want on a monday and then limit themselves to two to five hundred calories on a tuesday and then do that you know what i mean like yeah or, that was always crazy to me but, it works but hey for some people. It, you know yeah. like whatever you can tolerate right um i think the key here is that you want to you want to sort of there's a there's a lot and in fact your your optimal uh length of time would be really really um evident to you if you had really like tight blood like if you could draw blood in like like a controlled environment because what you want to do is you want to have ketones start to show up. Ketones, as many of us have heard, like ketogenic diets, etc. cetera. Um, ketones are the byproduct of the breakdown of fat for energy rather than sugar, rather than glucose, right? Can you explain that? Yeah. So um, when you eat something, right, um, the only two things that our body can use for energy are glucose, which is a sugar, or ketones which is a sort of another molecule that like i said is the end product of the of breakdown of a fat molecule um glucose is the main thing that we are always using we use it as glucose we store it as another form called glycogen which is basically just a storage form that's like readily available in our muscles and our liver and so on and so forth but when glucose is not around you're in your you know your body is of the of the idea that hey where is the food Right. Like, mm. let me go dip into the stores, which is your fat. You start to burn down, break down fat a little bit for energy. And when you start to do that, ketones are the end product. Ketones, um, in a, in a bad situation, usually diabetics. Okay. In a situation called diabetic ketoacidosis, where they build up really to a hot, to like unhealthy levels and they, they're acidic and the blood, the blood, the blood becomes acidic and it's really bad. Or in a starvation state, a prolonged starvation state where they build up too, that's also bad. But you want them to like, you want to burn enough fat, like use enough fat for energy that they sort of show up because they do some things to your body on a, on a molecular level. It's they like change some things. The, it's like threading the needle a little Very bit. Very much so. Okay. Very much so. And then you want to replenish your stores so that you don't rely solely on ketones. So what happens when, let's say you're a 16-8 person, which mm -hmm. is like the standard, quote yeah, unquote, I think it's standard. Faster. It's what I aim for when I'm doing it. What happens... At 16 hours, now I eat something. Let's say I eat something decent. I'm not eating shit, right? Mm -hmm. What happens now? Yeah, that, so they, now you've introduced you've introduced uh, food into the body and your insulin levels are going to spike up, right? And they're going to say, hey, food's back. You know what I mean? Let's go back to let's go back to our normal uh, regularly scheduled program of using glucose as this energy substrate. Let's put, you know, let's, let's put into the storage system whatever we have, you know, like, or, you know, whatever is around. And the ketones sort of like they're, you know, they're, they're out they go out the urine and, you know, they sort of, things go back to normal. You stop using fat as your main substrate, energy substrate, and you start to, and, and protein, you use that too when you're in a starvation state. And you go back to using glucose and glycogen for the most part. How quickly does this process happen? Within five minutes of eating? I, uh, well, mm, that's, that's tough to, that's tough for me to say, cause, um, I don't really, like, there's, there's a PhD somewhere that would be able to answer that question okay. like, immediately, right. but the Thank truth of the matter, yeah, oh, 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 dude, I, I am not the fucking smartest guy in any room I've ever been in. Um, but so there smartest are, smartest guy in here. No, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so there, there's definitely, um, there's definitely immediate changes that happen whenever, whenever food hits your stomach, right? Like there's, there are. There are enzymes that are being released and, and protein changes and stuff. I mean, if you've ever seen somebody who is having low blood sugar, right, and then uh, was like getting a little bit like, a little woozy and then like took like a sip of apple juice and they pop back like mm. very quickly. So there are very rapid changes that occur. And then there's some more long-term changes. Because remember, 
food boluses have to be broken down. Food bolus? When you eat something, you chew it up and then it goes into your stomach. Now okay. it's like a ball of stuff. Right? Yeah, you're it's, using big words on sorry me. To, sorry to apologize. <laughs> so it's a ball of stuff and it needs to be broken down. And um, it, you know, as it goes through your GI tract, it's processed. It's broken down into smaller and smaller pieces to the point where now it can go and and you know interact with the lining of your of your stu- of your mm. GI tract, your small intestine, and be brought in as small molecules Got that it. are able to be transferred from the, the GI tract, which is technically outside the body, right? Mm. Like mouth to, to anus is outside the body. Because it's, it's not, it's not, it's protected by a, by a, a layer of, of yeah, cells. Yeah. Once the transition occurs from there to inside, it has to be in really, really small pieces. It takes a while to get to that small pieces, you know? So the more complex something is like a, that's, you know, you heard the term complex carbohydrate versus simple sugar. Simple sugars go right in and they act really fast and they spike insulin like a mother bitch. The complex ones, they take longer to break down and they go in a kind of slower pace and Which that's why you want that's why they're yeah. that's why they're considered more healthy and that's like comparing apple sugars to chocolate sugars. correct yeah or even yeah i mean even apple sugars are pretty simple it's like um comparing because understand that like what celery is made of is technically a sugar like cellulose really? yeah like it's just it's just you can't you it just fucking taste horrible like you just can't you can't right but if you, ha it only tastes horrible because you can't break it down to the to the form of sugar that tastes good which is glucose and all you know all the simple ah, sugars that's how they get you it, you actually cannot digest like fibrous stuff because it's too the chain is too big but when it gets to small that's why you have some uh in your saliva you have some enzyme to break down sugar to mm-hmm. make it simple enough so that your tongue will taste it got it which that is wild sense. because we're eating something that's sweet and 90 percent of that shit's not even like hitting the tongue, it's going right into the stomach. It's like, well, what was the point of eating that thing that tasted so good? Because that little bit that we did taste was so awesome, but the rest of it just made us have a dumpy ass. Right. It, there's also, though, it depends on who you are, like anything else, because, you know, like I have good friends who are serious, serious athletes, right? Yeah. And, and they're training all the time. They'll yeah. do two-a-days and stuff like that. And so they got to eat all yeah. the time. They Intermittent fasting quite literally for their schedule would not be possible. Mm. But what do they do? Mm. In addition to replacing all the nutrients they get in through crazy training, some of the people I know also are very, very diabolical about every single thing that goes in. Yeah. So there's a reason that like, oh, this week we're going to do sweet potatoes of some form at 6 a.m. And then we're going to have meal X at Mm. at 12 p.m. Mm. or something. You know what I mean? Like something like that. And so... You can, the amazing thing about the body when you're talking about being able to break down fat and restore it as muscle Mm. and therefore get all the benefits of having a good blood flow and Mm. longevity that it turns into and and like a good quality of life. The beautiful part about it is that there's a million different ways to cut the cake and it has a lot to do with all the, all of your habits. Yes. You know, if I'm somebody that works a 12 hour job where I'm sitting down what I just said right there, first of all, I'm not doing two days in that scenario. Mm. What I just said, that's not going to work. No. You know, but if I'm the guy who's, you know, maybe I sit down eight hours a day. Right. But, you know, I'm a legit athlete. Right. And I do two days. Or, and that's an extreme example. But I do something like that. Yeah. Well, now it works. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that, um, I think the issue is, is that trying to take those people, first of all, those, the people that live that like super regimented lifestyle are such a small portion yes. of the population Very smart. right we're trying to extrapolate this to overall like population health like how can we get people to live because i said to my i was talking to my buddy today he's an orthodontist and um he works like a beast but he started fasting he's like i feel so much better i go yeah i mean you know i know that our our, our like ancestors didn't live very long but i bet you they didn't feel like shit all day yeah up until the day they died they were also trying to survive too you That's know what i mean thing. like they yeah. had a thing you know what i mean so but like you know what i mean like i, I don't think they had the like the aches and pains and the sort of like, you know, just the low energy and the, you know, just to just, you know, the, the, they didn't have a case of the Mondays, you know what I mean? Like, and I think it had a lot to do with the way that their life was, you know, based around, you know, uh, I have a lot, I have a lot of ideas about how, like what translates to like early ancestral, our ancestors early on and, and, and things that benefited them that fuck us over now, you know what I mean? Like share. I mean, you know, things like anxiety, you know, people come to me with anxiety Mm. issues, right? It's like, well, anxiety was important when you were running away from lions because the physiological Mm. response of anxiety would end for in one of two circumstances. You either successfully ran away from the lion 
or you fucking died because the lion ate you. Whoa. One of those yeah. two things ended that norepinephrine, cortis- you know, this massive like send the blood to the brain and the muscles and beat the heart fast and breathe harder and all the things. And now it's like, how am I going to pay for my kid's college? And that lion never, ne- you never get away from that lion and that lion never kills you. What do they say about exercise? That's a really broad question. I'll answer. I'm sorry. Uh, there's, that could be a million things. But like um, the point I'm trying to make mm. is that they say it's a release. Yes. It's a stress release. Yes. It resets your hormones. I'm yeah. just speaking out of medical terms here. But like that's, does, that it, is the broad thing it does. Why does it do that? Because we are animals. Mm. We, it, our ancestors, to your point, I love this example you mm. just used. They were running away yeah. from things that could fucking eat them, yes. you know? Yeah. And so they had to deal with that. They had they couldn't be obese, yeah. right? You know, they're dead if they do that. They had to survive. Not until know? we become like, not until so civilization starts to like form where there's like roles where people who are protected from being out yes. there in danger can become obese. Everybody else, like if you, if you weren't like in shape, like I think about it all the time, like- I'm the guy that's like if in my group like my group of friends are out to dinner and I have like weird thoughts in my head. I'm like, if the zombie apocalypse came, I'm I'm the guy that's I'm gonna, fucked. I'm fucked. <laughs> They're all gonna outrun me. <laughs> Nobody's tripping me, but they don't have to. You know what I mean? Like yeah. so I'm like, I'm you know. But yeah, no, I think it's I think um a lot of things and exercise is a great way. It's funny, it's funny because they're trying to find study, they're trying to study this to the point where like they show real improvement in mood and so on and so forth. And they, they have a real rough time like really quantifying it and showing it in studies, but there's no way that you're going to tell me that somebody who exercises on a regular basis in a healthy way, not in an unhealthy way, yes. yeah. um, doesn't, isn't going to feel better. They do. They, they pay, just do they take that. But you said it best. They take that generational or biological genetic energy. Mm. that's always been built in and they put it somewhere. Yeah. You know, and so when you are like the quote, I've said this on the podcast before, but people will say the the hardest thing for a man to do is sit alone in in a in a room alone with his thoughts and be okay. Yes. And the concept is if you're just sitting alone in a room in perpetuity, your mind starts racing. You start thinking all these things. You're going to go crazy. Exactly. So like, dude, even the smallest things, because like I said, I'm sitting down more than I ever have in my Mm -hmm. life. Like. I'll go, I'll eat lunch around someone and they'll be like, dude, like relax because I'm taking the plate and it's not even nervous. I just, I'm, I'm very calm when I'm doing it, but I'm like, Oh, I don't have to be sitting down in the studio. So I take the plate right here. I walk around, I'll throw the phone on speaker in the Island. Sometimes I'll just like eat standing up and they're like, sit down, relax, stay a while. (laughs) I'm like, no, no, like you don't understand. Like I'm putting it somewhere right now. Smallest little thing like that, you know, but we get like, we talk about the mental health crisis with COVID to pull it back there. You know, I'd love to know what you've seen because what do you what do you expect from people? Of course, you know, the economy took a shit for a while. People lost their jobs. Yeah. Everything changed. They're at home. They can't go anywhere. They can't see people. People started sitting down all the time. Mm-hmm. They're not working out. There's no camaraderie. Like, wh- what the fuck do you think they're going to do? We are, there is no, there are, I mean, there's, there's actual data and like uh, published studies that are showing that there is just a massive increase in, um, you know, presentations in the emergency room for acute mental health disasters. Like what? Um, um, well, I mean, like like all all things related to depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations, things of that nature, right? Um, increased use in alcohol uh, off the charts, increased use in drugs, mm. drug-related overdoses, um, you know, all of those things. And in my, so I do hospital medicine and I also do primary care. Um, and in my primary, in my hospital medicine setting, like there, there, there was just like, this new normal where, you know, a third of the emergency room was constantly, you know, uh, filled up with people who were there for mental health related issues that were a not, third. yeah. At any given time, if the, if the emergency room had 30 patients in it, like 10 of them were there either like boarding long-term because they couldn't find a place to send this person, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, or, you know, was coming in for some sort of like, um, like I said, suicide attempt or, you know, drug overdose or something that had related to that swath of, of things. It, it, it it was, it's, it's not even close. It absolutely skyrocketed during this time, you know? Um, so yeah, it, it, that is the, those are part of the un, sort of the unseen, like the non-sexy uh, numbers, you know? CNN used to love to have that death toll up there, man. You know what I mean? Like it was like disaster porn at its finest, but there are a lot of things brewing underneath that weren't just long COVID that were, you know, the fall of relationships you know, I saw, I don't know if it was a comedian or somebody said, marriages are obviously shown to be 
you know, uh, like a 12 or 14 hour a day job, not a 24 hour a day job, you know, like people who had to spend all day in a room with each other and they didn't go to separate jobs. Like that's a rougher, that's rougher. That's a rougher relationship dynamic. Um, so just a lot of things, a lot of fallout, but you know, um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of things about, you know, trying to kind of take what we used to do naturally and, and, and put that into our lives today, which is, I think, you know, fasting. Like, so there's a guy, the head of, uh, genetics and aging at Harvard university, David Sinclair is his name, David Sinclair. He said, he's showing, he's talking all the time about the fact that they are able to control the lifespan of their animal models purely based on how often they feed them. Whoa. Caloric restriction has always been the most proven way to extend life, right? But now they're able to take animals and say like, we'll feed that rat a lot often, you know, uh, every couple of whatevers and we'll feed that rat every whatever. And one of them is going to live longer and I'm going to tell you which one and they prove it and they do it. All right, so here's something I've always wondered about this, actually, when you talk about, like, rats and, and testing. Because I recognize that a lot of studies, be it straight-up science studies or particularly in the context we're talking about, like, medical studies, start with animals. Yeah. And that's always been the case. But whether it be rats or some sort of other organism that has a different setup in, in at least some ways than a right. human body, different lifespan, the whole bit, like, how... How accurate, and you don't have to give me an exact percentage, but like how accurate is that stuff versus how much of it is just to say like, all right, let's see if we're in the right direction here. Yeah, that's exactly what we, that's exactly what those things are for. Like you have to, you have to try it out in an, in a controlled environment to start off like, uh, you know, in a, in a dish, right? Like in a, in a situation where you just take a, you know, take something, inject it into a cell or whatever, you know, whatever it is that you do. And then from there, if that works, then you get to graduate to trying it in an animal, right? That's uh, as close to us as possible, right? Um, and then, but no matter how close you get, you're not going to ever get your real answer until you try it in humans, right? But yes, it is very much about, are we going in the right direction? Can we, you know, and if it fails in an animal out of any sort, then there's really no point in moving on, right? Um, so that's the that's the reason for trying it on and and remember you know you you're using you're attempting to, i guess from an ethical standpoint, i i hate it cuz like i hear i hear about some experiments done on done on dogs and and and, yeah, and chimpanzees and shit fucking breaks up. my heart like i i cannot st like i yeah I don't i'm know. not afraid to say by the way you know i'm sorry there's an enormous difference between <laughs> there's an enormous difference between what they do on a rat and a dog like if that if peter wants to get on me for that fuck it like, no i think there's a, i think there's a big uh you know it's funny i think um I think that people don't recognize the le what the difference between pain and suffering is. Mm. Uh, pain is like uh, you know it's a thing it's a it's a signal sent to a, n a central nervous system or in the case of like you know invertebrates not a central nervous system but it, it's a signal that says that you know that hurts move away from that right um, and suffering which is like the ability to be cognizant of how shitty your situation is. And a lot more animals are intelligent enough to suffer than we understand. And those are the animals. All animals should be treated as cohabitants, uh, co-inhabitants of the planet with some level of respect. I under, I, I am very much believe that we, we should eat meat and so on and so forth. Yep, but, yep. but there's a way there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely, there's no way you can look at a fucking pig that spent life in a slaughterhouse and go, that pig didn't fucking know how bad it had it. Right. It did. It, right. And it suffered. And pigs you know? are smart too. There's, that's what I'm saying. And a dog knows when it's when its situation is bad. Like that, you know. Like so, that's the thing. As I think, is like when you start to have animals that are, you know, when you can really, like, really recognize that the animal has the intelligence level to suffer. You should stop fucking doing bad things to that mm -hmm. animal in the name of like advancing medical science and stuff like that. Like, well said. Be a better way. Well said. But on the actual point where you brought this up, where you were saying. The rats, he found that the ones at caloric deficit, yeah. I think were your words. Yeah, caloric restriction. Had better yeah, longevity. They had lower longevity. And that, like I said, so there's, there are the, there are increase in some gene products that make, that are, that, uh, like, re, you know, that are protective to cells against damage. There are decrease in some gene products that are like cancer causing and, and, and sort of like, uh, would would damage the cell and and it's sort of like the the 30,000 foot view every time you eat 
right? You create energy with the food that you put into your body. When you use that, when you use food to create energy, when you use glucose to create the, the end product that we use as energy, which is ATP, it's a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. We take adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and we add a phosphorus to it to make it ATP. And then we run all of our bodily reactions on busting off that phosphorus and sending it back to ADP. And that it's a little- So in English, a lot of science shit happens. And if you don't use all of it, it gets stored. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and well, actually, no. I mean, so when you make that thing that I said- you actually, uh, that's the reason you breathe oxygen. You need oxygen to do that thing. And when you use that oxygen, that oxygen now becomes oxidative damage. You know, you ever heard antioxidants, blueberries, acai, yes. all this shit? Okay, yes, yes. That's what your antioxidants are supposed to mitigate the damage caused by oxygen use for metabolism. So in a way, the less, because I think there's a couple different angles to look at like burning fat and using energy and stuff but mm. in this lane that we're looking at it the less overdrive you can have of the not antioxidant stuff yeah equals yes. the less the cell less, damage less right. damage okay. right. i mean they at least see it in hibernating animals animals that feed up get a layer of fat and then kind of slow their whole metabolism down i mean the fucking turtles live 100 years because they got a slow yeah. metabolism slower animals live longer slow metabolism hummingbirds die like that like the less but we also want to have a fast metabolism to be able to burn you, stuff you, right well only you only need a fast metabolism if you're if you are trying to lose weight if you never have to get to that point then you kind of want that like that goldilocks metabolism the one that uses what it needs and doesn't store too much but stores enough interesting you know? so if you change like let's talk about like intermittent fasting for mm -hmm. one sec bring it back in mm -hmm. if you change your habits over a long form to intermittent fasting that also technically slows down your metabolism then in that scenario no that so that that whole like thought process between like eating many small meals will increase your metabolism is sort of debunked you know what mm -hmm. i mean like you just switch energy substrates it's like at the end of the day it's always going to be you're always going to be making the thing you need to to make energy but what do you use do you use sugar that's available like or do you use the fat that you've stored? And when you use the fat that you've stored, you turn out you do less damage. So why does Michael Phelps, for example, because this is one of the more ridiculous examples mm -hmm. I, I ever heard, when he was at his peak and training, he was known to eat I, I don't remember the number, but it was a ridiculous it was five digits of mm -hmm. calories every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And he would his diet was set up such that a lot of it would be like hardcore like baked cd you know pizza mm -hmm. like shit that's not supposed to be good for you that was just very high in carbohydrates mm -hmm. of some form that mm -hmm. he could eat in high masses such that the ridiculous training he did it would get used my thought there though was if you're eating so much shit that's like in that case processed mm -hmm. and changes to sugar in your body which is right along the vein of what you just said you shouldn't do yeah like why did that work so well and give him such high energy well that dude is oh i mean it's not like they, they gave him the energy he required it i mean he was like mm. i mean what he like, swimming is the most uh is the most taxing one of the most taxing movements that we do yeah it's, it's your like, whole body you know what i mean like so like he was routinely like you have sh stored sugar in your muscles that's that, that's the quickest form of like i need energy can give me something called glycogen he was constantly like depleting his glycogen and refilling it back up with that, you know, plate of baked ziti, right? Like, so, I mean, I don't know if he's the appropriate uh, uh, approach to take from a, like, a, once again, this guy's a genetic freak, yes. right? Like, yes. you know what I mean? Like his body fat, his body fat percent, you know what I mean? Like what he's doing is insane. And yeah, there's, there's, there's tons to be said about, like, we could go down a huge, you know, uh, you know, one day we're going to bring a whiteboard. Like, like I, I hate the fact that I, got, I have a couple of friends and we'll go to like, you know, when we were kids, we go to McDonald's and they would eat like three times as much as me. And I would smell what they ate and I'd gain five pounds and they would just never, they would never put an ounce of body fat on. And there's a lot of things metabolically happening different in their bodies than mine. Right? Yes. It's not just, a lot of it has to do with like we overeat and self-control, et cetera. But like the, it's funny, that process that I told you about creating energy, turns out the more efficient it is right the fatter you probably will get mm. people who have an inefficient energy creation process a lot of the food that they use will sort of like be just 
That's really genetic. They won't go. Yeah, it's genetic. It won't go down. It won't go down. It won't go down the like. It won't end up where it needs to be, and it, it'll be like just kind of like fall off as heat. Or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, you know, it's a really complex process, but the truth is, is like, um, there are a lot of bio, biochemical and molecular processes that dictate how you use your, you know, what you put in your body and the best way to give yourself the best chance of being healthy, feeling well and living long is to eat good foods and eat it less often. It's kind of the, I'm the not, ribbon. I'm not a guy like I just don't really spend on stuff. I've just never, I don't know. Like I've also never really had money, so mm, yeah. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't had the ability to. But I really don't. Both, pal. I really don't buy much. But one thing that when I do have money, I'm looking forward to spending on, mm -hmm. just as like a passion project, and also like for your health. Is I want to be one of those guys who spends a lot of money investing in my body. Okay, right. I'm not talking like plastic surgery no, and shit I like understand. that. Although I could probably look a little better for sure. But you know, <laughs> like guy. looking at it. <laughs> good, I got a guy. Good. We'll, we'll be talking. <laughs> but in all seriousness, like looking at the health stuff. I love seeing some of the athletes, including like genetic specimens. Yes. Like, and I'm less familiar with Michael Phelps, so I won't use that example for this, but like LeBron James. Okay. LeBron James, I mean, he's the greatest specimen I've ever, I've ever seen. Easily. What I love about LeBron James though, too, is his work ethic is insane. Yeah. The guy has been spending like over seven figures dating back like a decade ago on his body every year. Mm. So he's already built like like a Greek god. Right? I think better I think a better example of what you're saying is Tom Brady, who's not That's built like a genetic specimen yeah. who is who has taken a very like, you know, qu NFL quarterbacky body but has turned it into the ability to play to be one of the top best five quarterbacks in the NFL in his 40s based purely off of being a really good quarterback but also like how he's what he's done to treat his body a certain way. Tom Brady's the other example from the other end that I would absolutely go to. Okay. The reason I was leading with LeBron, Give me LeBron. Okay, why LeBron is because he like you ever seen Tom Brady run a forty? All right, so it's a it's a joke. The worst thing I've ever seen in my right. life. You know, no disrespect to the goat. But no. I'm just saying, like, LeBron James, he's God, you know, and yet he still Yes. Still yes. invests like that because it makes a difference. That's why he's oh, yes. 19 years oh, into yes. an NBA career yes. playing, averaging almost 30 points. A game. It's unbelievable. Right. Like, you don't think, like, like I, I wonder, I tell, I say this to people all the time. You don't think that there were been, like, I don't know, just purely on numbers. I mean, we're talking about 8 billion more, like, people on the planet, right? That's an insane amount of people. Like, you don't think that there's been at least 100 people who were significantly better than Michael Jordan at basketball who never either picked up a basketball or if they did, they didn't come anywhere near how hard he worked. You're talking naturally. Yeah. I'll, like I'll this is, this is, yeah. the, this is where like the, like nature and nurture coming together to make a mm. better product. Right. Yes. I mean, there are dudes who have been cut out of marble, yeah. you know what I mean? Who look like LeBron, but would never be as successful as LeBron because of that extra. That's where the nurture has now taken over. And it's, you know, it's funny cause your podcast, when I, you know, when I listen to it, it always seems to be like attempting to find the answer that is in the middle of the two extremes of anything. Yes. Pol politics or whatever. Glad you got that. This Thank is exactly you. the same. When we're talking about like human performance or just, or to extrapolate it to the everyday guy or girl, how do you fucking feel? Right. And how sick are you or not? It is always a combination of nature and nurture. Right. You know, mm -hmm. they go look for these clusters of people that are, you know, around the world where they're like, oh, there's like a ton of people there that lived over a hundred. Like, what are they doing? How much sun are they getting? How much, what is their diet? And it's like, okay, that's cool. But like on the grand scale, that doesn't work for people who are like, you know, to use LeBron James in Cleveland, Ohio, right? They're mm -hmm. like, their, their surroundings are a little bit beat up and, you know, they're eating a lot of fast. How can we make those people feel better? And then it's like, now you have nurture has to take over a little bit more and you have to do a little bit more, more to invest in your health and what, and your body, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, I think it's the LeBron James is the is a great is probably the prime example of nature and nurture coming together. Like you took this guy who was already going to he, had he not done a single thing, he's going to be a top fifty player of all time. I agree. And then he excelled. He 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 puts in the extra effort to be to go down in history as probably, top if two. not the best basketball yeah. player of all time, certainly the most. Uh, uh, the, the most like just like absolute insane athlete to watch and and statistically decorated yeah it's i mean it's just it's and and it's it, it's such a cool thing and and to go back to your brady example as well you know 
looking at it from the end of someone who had no business being there. Right. Now, more nurture than nature. What I will say is for all the lack of athleticism and like being ripped and stuff that Tom Brady doesn't have, mm. he, de- he did, you can watch tape of him in high school. Yeah. I almost wonder how teams missed it. He did have a very natural ability to throw a football. Oh, yeah. And he trained well, it. He played at Michigan. You know what I mean? Like it's just, yeah, uh, it's, I mean, he was a, br- he, that ball was always pretty. No, I mean, you know what I mean? No. So there's still an element of that. But think about it. The guy played in the NFL, taking hits. You know, I, I, he was playing at the top of his game, leaving. It's the greatest Dude, he thing could ever. Come back in three years and be a and be a guy that almost anybody would trade their quarterback for in three years. Maybe, yeah. Because of the way you know, like he's the kind of guy that, like you know, I I tell my patients all the time, like you know, especially my guys that are like like big, like you know, they like working out in the gym and doing a lot of lifting, you know, but you know, they look great and it's like you know they're ready for the Jersey Shore, but like you know, but their cholesterol's shitty and their blood pressure's like, I'm like, dude, you love to wash the car, but you hate to change the oil. You know what I mean? Like, what do you, you know, what is going on here? So Tom Brady cares about what's going on with his body to the point, and so does LeBron James. And that's what makes them, yeah. you know, and, and, and how you can take that and apply it to your, like how you are as a per like, you know, your avoidance of chronic illness and sort of how you feel on a day-to-day basis and be the best anything that you want to be. And it's not going to be a basketball player for most of us, but most of us is going to be just like being a living, breathing person is to fucking invest a little bit in the nurture side. Your your genetics are what you got. Yep. But there's definitely a lot of things you can do to treat your body in, in, uh, in a certain way that it'll and, it'll and it'll respond, you know? That's like, when my, with my practice, I have a very, uh, like, I because I have a different kind of practice, I, so I have a smaller group of people, and I'm tr- my goal is to, like, for none of them to develop diabetes. And mm. I'm, I'm really, really passionate about trying to make sure that I have a cohort of people that I can get to never develop diabetes and i'm probably going to have a a a, a few but i'm going to try my damnedest in 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 a a multifaceted approach to prevent that from happening and i and i'm going to use some of these tools like moving around a a lot more than you already do or you know intermittent fasting or you know paying attention to what are you putting your body all the things you know what i mean like in addition to medications obviously but um but yeah LeBron James and Tom Brady are very, very good examples of what you can do to take everything to the next level when you just, when you do what modern science is like, hey, these fucking things work. I'm looking forward to the day where we can get up in the morning and walk into the mirror in our own self-contained network, hopefully, mm. and and be able to have a quick process of your iron levels are low. Mm. They're at X percentage right now. Like all these different things to be able mm. to say, here's a way to remedy it. Optimize so, your day. Yes. With, with, so, you know, I have one patient who I just saw uh, the other day who had seen had visited this like longevity center where they did a head to toe. Like they, uh, CAT scans of everything, MRIs of everything, uh, mm. blood work, and you know, uh, all of the all the testing to feet to spit out. And I think that's becoming like a little bit of a thing. You see this with like these forward, you know, these like new these new like healthcare microsystems that are attempting to like use a ton of data. Um, I think there's going to be some cool ways, you know, to because the truth be told is I can measure if you're in the hospital setting, I could I could take your blood four times a day and tell you, yes, you know, minute yes. to minute, you know, so we yeah. can already do something yes. like that. Yeah. But um, right now we're in a position where um, there's a lot of information that's going to be given to a patient that is clinically irrelevant, but anxiety driving. So yeah. like the full body scans one day when imaging gets cheaper and safer and quicker. Getting a full body full body MRI might be a good thing as long as everybody's really really hip to the fact that like there are all kinds of things growing inside your body right now that probably don't belong there if you think that you belo- belong looking like Da Vinci's man picture right that are not cancer and it's okay that they're yes. there they're not supposed to be there but they're so they're not going to kill you how cool would it be though if a scan like that mirror Told you example that you walk in and it said oh by the way we just read you have like what's a small number of cancer cells that's like normal uh, i don't want to say normal you're all, like, you all you all every minute of every day you're growing a cancer cell in your body and right. it's and it's your body's telling it like commit suicide you don't belong here okay so let me use you, a ridiculous yeah, it start, it's not, starting to hit to it's, it's a critical point like it's, it's getting to the point where the, this might turn into a tumor 
let's let's give it an arbitrary. Who cares? You make the number because I don't want to sound like yeah. Let me make about. an arbitrary yeah, yeah, number go, go, go. for like the blockheads out go there, ahead. like me. <laughs> let's say it says, oh, there's ten cancer cells right. right there in the area of your pancreas. Right. No big deal. But by the way, just have a fiber pill today. Right. And somehow it'll go. That right. doesn't make any sense. But you right. know what I mean. Yeah. Like that will be so cool because people will get to see in real time. Mm -hmm. It's like you talk about full body MRIs. I remember in. I think I was in, I was young when I asked this question. I might've been like late middle school or early high school. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about the healthcare system. We can talk about that. Mm. But like, I, have some, I used I have to- I have some thoughts. I think someone got sick who I knew. Okay. And I was thinking about like mitigation. Right. It was cancer. And I'm like, well, why doesn't everyone just get like a full body MRI? Yeah. Like, you know, I would do it three times a year. Right. And then my teacher was explaining to me, they're like, well- that costs like, I don't know, $2,000 a pop, mm -hmm. insurance pays for it. So like, it's a money thing. Oh yeah. And I'm like, damn, what if we could have that over time, money and convenience comes together and in a way that convenience goes right. up and money lowers. As the technology so, improves yes. where it's not as expensive, right? Exactly. And I And I think that's a, so it's interesting you say that it's a money thing because um, when you, the definition of a screening test, right? Like, so screening, right? is something that is re the guidelines for what to screen for are brought down by a, a group called the United States Preventative Task Force. And they spent a lot of time deciding what tests, what things we should screen for and who should get screened and how we should do that. And a screening test has to meet certain parameters in order to be um, recommended. It should be something that can be done easily, right? And if you find something, can you do something about it Right. And it also should be safe. And lastly, it should be cost effective. Right. Mm. So that, that is one of the key things. So they just expanded the criteria for lung cancer screening because and it's like, well, why doesn't everybody get screened for lung cancer? It's a low dose CAT scan of the chest. Like, why not? Well, it's like, well, they spent a long time figuring out, like, who are the people more likely to develop lung cancer? And if we catch it early, what right. can we do? We now do something. And now that we are able to do something about early caught lung cancer. And we know the types of people that are more likely to get it. We screen those people. We don't screen everybody because, A, it would cost a lot of money. It's exposure to radiation. And lastly, there are a lot of things that thing. are going to show yeah. up on the CAT scan that you don't have anything to do about, but it's going to make people nervous. And again, that's a full test. It's reading papers and it's stuff like that. You think about the world 25, 30 years, whatever it is out, where it's like, no, no, it's just like a quick that's like, what laser I, beam. I can't, yes. We you are know? going to get to, think about colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is the gold standard to, to screen for colon cancer right now and mm -hmm. for diagnosis of cancer. But the, here comes Cologuard and this like fecal immunohistochemical, immunohistochemical. Cologuard? Cologar, it's just basically like, you know, taking a, a stool sample and based on the DNA, you know, some of the cells that come off the colon and checking this, you know, to see, are they, what's the, what's oh, the, the shit of them. test? Pretty I much. did that. Yeah. yeah. So now, yeah. so now we're starting to sort of like see as a screening alternative to somebody who doesn't want to undergo a colonoscopy, you can get the, the test, the, 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 the which is less invasive. And it's exactly what you're saying. Now it's a, like cheaper and more convenient. And now it's, you know, we're, we're merging those things. Now, the problem with that is, is like, if it comes back any sort of like way, you got to get a colonoscopy anyway, because it's still the most important test, but it's, it, you're seeing that change that you're mm -hmm. predicting, right? Where you're seeing that, that sort of like coming up with a cheaper, quicker, safer way to get more information that it can be acted upon earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we prop, we don't screen for pancreatic cancer because when it happens, it grows really fast yeah. and it's devastating. It, and that's like, the most deadly, one of the most deadly ones. And right? not because, not because pancreatic cancer is like, uh, like, you know, because it's like decided to be angry. It's just because it grow it like it's quiet and it grows quickly and you don't realize it until one day you're yellow as a banana and you can't understand why. And you go get the CAT scan and the, well, there it is, mm. you know, so, so it's crazy. That, it like, is shit, very you're crazy. You're just having a normal life going about your day. And then like one day, Oh, this, this thing's been growing for 90 days. You're and that's, fucked. and that's the inherent issue there is like how much. How much information do you want to know? Mm. Because if you can't do anything about it, all you did was add a period of time in your life where you lived under like a death sentence, you know? So like right now, they, there was a recent law passed where patients have access to all their charts and documents and notes and all the other stuff in real time, which should a, doc, should a patient be, have a free access to their medical records? Yes, it's their data. However- That wasn't the case. It is the case, but it's like, should they get the study results- before they talk to me, like they're mm. laying in their, they're laying in their hospital bed 
and they get their CAT scan report back. I'm dead. <laughs> and it says something like, cannot rule out n- malignant neoplasm. Yeah. No and I walk into the room and they're in tears. I go, what's wrong? They're like, I have cancer. I'm like, no, you have a small bowel obstruction. Like you don't, like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't, like, yes. but you know what I mean? Like, you know, it, 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 you're not qualified to interpret that to anything other than it's the same thing as like, if you Google your symptoms, you're going to come up with something that's going to kill you. They basically did that and said, here, go run wild with it. So yeah, the healthcare system is. I see where this is going, doc. And I, I want to come back to it Gus, because yeah, I want to like close out the conversation yes. on that. Yeah. I want to close out though, before I just used that twice. I was fucked that's up, right, but back to back I wanted to come back to the thing that we were kind of like getting through and went on some really good tangents with Which it was? just to like get it all done. But when we were talking about, the tide turning where information started to come out. You had mentioned there was a big study, I think, oh, yes. in the New England or whatever. And then we started talking about respirators. And then we mm. came back one other time, talked about something else. Maybe How did diet. I notice things were changing? Yes. And then if you don't mind, and if we get there, great. If we don't, great. You also had brought up in there in a tangent about the mental health yeah. trade-off in the epidemic. Okay. So there's there's two things on the bone here that I think are important now that we're two years out of COVID, over mm-hmm. two years, mm-hmm. to be able to see where we're at. And that is when you thought the tide could have changed and therefore changed in society sooner than it did, possibly. Mm-hmm. Don't want to put words in your mouth. Okay. And also when you started to see the other things, whether it be like drug overdoses yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. were mounting to a point where it's like, well, what what's the least evil here? So early on, very, this is, a, this is, I mean, this is a very interesting, like, sort of like uh, trip down memory lane for me because uh, early on, um, you saw a very swift and impactful change in the things that were coming into the hospital. It, it, it got to a point very quickly that the only patients that were coming into the hospital were patients that were COVID-19 patients. Okay. And... It was both because people were on lockdown Mm -hmm. and people with illnesses and even people without chronic illnesses who normally come to the emergency room were scared shitless of going. The hospital was like the grounds. You didn't want to go there. I I will never forget this, Doc. I I lived close to one up in North Jersey, one of the main ones, and about a block and a half away. And I went for a walk maybe like four days into quarantine. And it was a fucking military base. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, if I'm somebody coming up, if yeah. I had a broken arm right now, I might be like, fuck it, I'll come back tomorrow. Yeah. Like, it was scary. You want to talk about that? You want to talk about like like a, like a change? It's like, well, we 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 had it in my, so where I did residency, um, we had a separate building um, that was connected by a sky bridge that was basically for neurosurgery, urologic surgery, neuro, uh, neurology, like the neuro ICU strokes and that kind of thing. Um, ear, nose, and throat, like very specialized surgical subspecialty orthopedics. And because there were no, um, you know, no voluntary surgery, non, non-emergent surgeries happening and we needed to play, we kicked, I mean, we, <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't making decisions, but the, you know, the, 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 the pulmonary critical care department, like kicked everybody out of there and said, no, no, that's our, our place now. Mm. And built that into like the fortress of COVID. And when you went over there, it was like, I mean, there's people in hazmat suits and there's, you know what I mean? Like there, you know, and then I go to my, I go to the hospital I worked at after residency, which like, you know, same thing, you know, we're talking like the cafeteria was turned into a COVID ward. You know what I mean? Like, and it's like, this is where I used to get pizza. It's funny because I took my first job at a residency is where I, uh, a hospital I rotated at a medical school. And I'm like, I'm tre- I'm like seeing a patient with COVID-19. I'm like, this is where I used to stand to get pizza, like in, like in medical school. And here I am like seeing this guy, you know, and you know, it was like, you know, just this very eerie feeling in that, you know, that everything was quarantined in, even inside the hospital, right? Like these like extra precautions. The PPE everywhere was a paper bag with like somebody's N95 and face shield and all this other shit. And they like ran out. So they had to like put your name on it. So like, you know what I mean? Like there were like entire lockers where you would go in, change your clothes and put on scrubs and then drop a, I, you know, stories of dudes who were like going home and like they had a pregnant wife. So they were sleeping in the garage and they would only yeah. communicate through the, through the, through the, the garage door. And it's like, this is fucking wild, you know? So you had that early on. And again, you and I were up. By ground zero. Yeah, I mean, right. well, so in, I, right, so beginning of in Philadelphia, and then I go back to North, then I go to North Jersey, and it's, right, exa- right and, and it was funny, because there was this sort of, like, there was these, like, like, maybe oasis, 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 uh, whatever the plural I is. I always make up plural words, too, like oasis. I, I, oasis. We're going to go with it. 
Octopuses Randall. actually is the plural of octopus. I looked that shit up the other day. God but anyway, oasis, oasis of relief in cases going down during like summer or whatever. You know what I mean? Like when there was, you know, there's like a lot of things. There's like transmission outside. It wasn't transmission inside. Whatever. We're, that's too much to talk about now. But the point is, is there were some sort of relief, but you didn't see any of the other chronic things that you normally saw, right? Then take that and couple. And they're of still them. happening. They're real. Oh no! And this is and, and and that's a spoiler alert because like not only are they happening, but like the outpatient world is also not seeing anybody either. There were people staying at home like they're having a heart attack. They're yeah. like, oh, it'll pass. Yeah, Fuck, yeah. Man. So then, then when the sort of here was what I thought when I I thought when I was the busiest when COVID comes when Delta comes around and the people who were not, you know coming for their like, you know, every three month hospital stay to get fluid removed or their kidneys, whatever. We're also like, I can't not come anymore. I can't, I'm, I'm fucked up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now here is this like convergence of like COVID patients coming back in, in, in rocket style numbers, plus the chronically ill who we used to just be keeping together with like, you know, duct tape and duct tape and bubble gum as it was. And here they are. They haven't been seeing a doctor in a year. This guy hasn't, hasn't had insulin in like three oh, months. that long, yeah. You know wow. what I mean? Like, because the outpatient world was was beat up. Like, telemedicine is great. And I think telemedicine is, is very much the future of the outpatient world. But golly, it was really, really wild to see this, like, now, like, this double. It, we used to be like, okay, COVID sucks. And this place looks like a war zone. But at least this is one, th- like, you, you know, your your brain was, like, in one mode where it's like, this is what we do for COVID patients. You know what I mean? Like, and and... Once we started to have some like guidelines, what to do with steroids and what kind of treatments, blah, blah, blah. It was sort of like, okay. And when did that, because that was the crux of the question. It sounded the way you were going earlier, mm-hmm. maybe like May. You yeah, started to I think see that's that a great, I think that's mitigation a great, yeah, I think that's at a, least. Yeah, I think that we, um, we could probably look up the, like when the, the study was published at some point where, where like dexamethasone and, and uh, the that steroid was, yeah. was like, hey, in fact, um, Temple University's rheumatology department developed a predictor of bad outcomes based on like a bunch of inflammatory markers, which early on we were ordering mm. blood tests like through the roof. But it's like at some point it's like, okay, this is a kind of a cool thing, but like it doesn't fucking matter. We're just, you know, we're getting all these like crazy pieces of information at the end of the day. It's like, can they breathe? Or they cannot, they, can they not breathe? Are they developing blood clots? Are they not developing, you know, all of this stuff really boiled down to like cooling off the inflammation and keeping their lungs protected while they tried to heal themselves. And that was about May. And so then, because when you look at viruses and before the pandemic, I never looked at any of this shit, but like some of the basics that I learned is that I might've learned it on the podcast too from somebody smarter than me, but you need as a virus, the ability, if you're thinking like the virus to survive. Mm. So when you start as, as a virus and you go into someone's body Mm -hmm. and you start, then you go into a bunch of people's bodies and you're killing them. Mm-hmm. You're killing the host. Mm-hmm. So this is why, generally speaking, over time, mm-hmm. all viruses, as they add on to hosts, get through the herd or whatever, they lessen their in danger because they realize, oh shit, we're killing everything. We need to just, we need to suck a little less blood, right? We need to be a little less of a leech. And so you see the quote unquote curve go down which is why you end up with something like omicron what was weird to me though is that the death percentage curve for a long time remained at least somewhat consistent Mm -hmm. until you got to omicron Mm -hmm. however we did see after maybe like that may period and whatever we did see fewer serious like ground zero scenarios like new york you know and i think a lot of that must have to do with at least earlier mitigation tactics that doctors learned on the fly i think you have three things i think three reasons why you didn't see a repeat of the new york situation right and that is as you very 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 eloquently put it put it together like you cannot like viruses do not typically present both deadly and contagious, you know, because you can only be so deadly if you also want to be contagious, right? Like, and that is why these like really, really crazy pandemics of infectious disease, like the Spanish flu or the black death, et cetera, happen only once every one, you know, couple hundred years, you know, or so because, you know, uh, infectious organisms would prefer to make copies of themselves. And that requires them to be able to get more hosts 
what viruses do, and, the, and I'm going to get to the other two things um, that I think uh, prevented that sort of, that what viruses do is um, the exact opposite of what we do. We may, every time we make a genetic mistake when we're trying to copy a cell, we have a proofreader that goes up and down the DNA and goes, no, 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 that's not the one. Take that out, replace it with the right one. That's okay. Mm. And that happens all the time. And when it, when we don't do that, we have mutations. Some of them are effective and they stay and other ones are not and the cancer and et cetera. Viruses are constantly mutating with no proofreading ability. And they are willing to sacrifice generations of themselves to hit the right mutation by accident on purpose that gets them to stick around. Mm. Right? So they're constantly fucking up. But like, but just complete, like rolling the rolling dice all day, every day, all day, every day, rolling the dice. And then they hit and it's like, okay, we got a, we got a new thing that keeps us going. So that's, you know, that's the mutagenesis of a virus. And because it became more contagious, like we saw the, we saw the Omicron just like spreading like wildfire, but like really not that yeah. many people were dying. It took long enough. I mean, Jesus Christ, it took two years. Well, there were so many fresh hosts where the, 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 you know, the virus could be like, I can kill you and pass on. I'll be all right. You know what I mean? So, and I think the other thing is obviously the, um, in like the treatments prevented some deaths, certainly, right? That steroids, the remdesivir certainly helped. Um, you Did know, people use that. Uh, what was it called? Hydra hydroxychloroquine. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also similar thing. Um, in the dish, it was interesting. It changed the pH of the, of the environment. So the viral rep, Application machinery broke down in people. It didn't work. All you had was a bunch of people with lupus who couldn't get their fucking medication because mm. it was being stockpiled in some, you know, somebody who knew a hospital CEO That's or some shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but there were two other things. There was three. You said. Oh, and yeah, and the third thing was our behavior. We, I mean, we did. You know, even if people hated it or didn't listen or whatever, like we did do a lot of things. Like we should be proud of ourselves in some way that like for at least a period of time, most of us did some, a lot of things that helped this thing not be a lot worse. And it spread almost, I, I very hesitate, I'm very hesitant to use this word because I don't want it taken out of context, but it spread in a more controlled manner that mm. way. Yeah. So that as you got it, quote unquote, across the herd so that the virus could get new hosts and then start to figure out yeah. how it needs to survive. You didn't see it happening where everyone walks into Grand Central Station, no one knows anything's right. going on, everyone walks out of there right. with COVID. That's the thing, right. Like, so, right. So, in fact, if you got COVID, when I got COVID, I know I did a thing that I shouldn't have did. Like, I went to, um, you know, it's funny because, like, I, I I was double vaccinated at the time, but it was, the vaccine was probably, now that we know that the vaccine sort of, like, loses its eff efficacy after a certain period of time, I was probably waning in my immunity, and I was... I went to see, I went to hang out with a couple of friends in the city and, you know, they, one of them is an infectious disease doctor or one of them is a pulmonologist and I'm a hospital, hospital doctor. And, you know, the three of us are in a room and we're like all, you know, and, and we're like re in really tight, like my friend's got, is a fellow in the city and she has this super tight apartments. Like, I don't know who gave who, what, what, but we, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're in there just like breathing each other's, you know, yeah. funk air, yeah. you know? And, um, and that type of thing happened less often later on so those situations where everybody walked in the grand social station one person went in sick and then the rest of everybody came out sick happened a lot less which i think was that's what was happening in New i York. mean dude we i mean like th uh, you know it got to the point where we in the hospital system you know we didn't see a fucking common cold we would see rhinovirus adenovirus enterovirus um f influenza pop up like, i think i like i would normally see personally see i don't know hundreds of those viruses come in and you test them in people who have really bad lung disease because like it doesn't matter if a 21 year old gets it but if a 75 year old who's you know three pack a day smoker gets rhinovirus that could be that could be curtains yes. so we test for it that's we, masking and, and social distancing like 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 i'll tell you this right now i do not advocate for living this way yes but we will we would not have common cold flu season type situations on a yearly basis that we had if we if we behave this way yeah I, i'm more of the what's the that, trade off though? that's the point i exactly yeah, I'm, I'm like you know what let's just get better at treating these exactly how about we get better at preventing people from having those really bad uh chronic lung diseases and heart diseases etc so that they can tolerate how, tackling the flu at 60 something years old like how, we can, how about we encourage people to be healthy that's my point yeah because the, the like the elephant, run do yeah, something the elephant in the room is the vast majority of the people that died, and please, whoever's listening to this, do not take this as that this is okay that this happened. 
because I'm the guy that believes that everybody who died from COVID, even if they were really, really, really already sick, and maybe they would have died in that calendar year anyway, I still go to work. And my entire career is based on keeping them alive long enough to catch season three of Ozark. I don't know how long it's going to be. Whatever <laughs> yeah. it is, whatever oh my it is, my God. job is to not let them die yeah. unless it's really their time and they're ready and everything is, you know, um, then they can be at peace. But like other words, I, I'm not cool with a certain amount of deaths because they had, you know, kidney failure or whatever. It's not just numbers on a page. That's so the patients. thing. You know what I mean? Like, and so, uh, you know, so my point is, is that like, but everybody that died was fat or old or had lung disease, man. And I'll even hedge for you. I'll say a a significant number of people were, a lot of people were, you know, yeah. and you look at the data. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you are supported in yeah. that. It's no, like, I, I wouldn't say it if I wasn't because yeah. I am overweight myself and, you know, and I have, and that's the thing. It's just funny because the comorbidities the argument is hilarious. Uh, you will watch somebody on TV being interviewed by some gotcha TikTok guy who's trying to <laughs> who's trying to catch a who's trying to catch somebody saying something to incriminate themselves, and you will Some see like a TikTok like a two hundred and fifty <laughs> pound dude with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth going like oh the people that died are the ones with comorbidities. I was like brother, I don't even know you, but you are a walking comorbidity. You know, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's like people think comorbidities means that like that person was going to die within the next half hour no. anyway. No, if you got five pounds of extra weight, you got a comorbidity. If you have asthma, you got a comorbidity. Have, if I you have drink severe asthma, yeah, if you comorbidity. If you yeah. drink alcohol more than two times a day, any day of the week, you have a comorbidity. Yeah, yeah I, and I think you know I got it, and who knows if I had it early on? I don't know. I, I'll tell you, I was all around New York, yeah, lean right yeah, up yeah, yeah, there, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. pretty hard to yeah, say yeah, I, right, I didn't get right. it. But when I actually got it and showed symptoms, wasn't until November 2021. And like I'm October 2021 again, I'm a dude in my 20s in good shape. Right. So even though I was a severe asthmatic, you know, comorbidities wise, I had a lot of other things going for me. And so you're I, working in your favor. Right. And I got a bad case, you know, where I was sick as a dog. Yeah. But like I survived the people who have like two of them, you know, they're a severe asthmatic and they're a little overweight or something like that. That's where it starts to get. It seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong. That's where it started to get like, oh, now it's dicey. Oh, yeah. I mean, I do 30 kid, 30 year old guy. I remember like a 30 year old guy at the hospital, like 380, 400 pounds. Yeah. He never had a chance, brother. Yeah. Never had a chance. Respirator. I, he didn't even make it to that point. We had yeah. him on the BiPAP, which is the non invasive positive pressure uh, mask. Um, we were going to intubate him. Difficult airway because of his neck size and the hole in the yards. He went into full on cardiac arrest because it was high, his hypoxemia was so profound. He, Ugh. he, he, you know, he never, and then performing CPR on a 400 pound man is just like, you know, you might as well, no, you got to drop flying elbows off the top rope. You got to be Randy Savage, you know, Macho Man to get that done. It's not, so yeah, I know. Right, this much is clear then. This much is clear. You know, like it, it was, it, it is certainly in our best interest to take a very, very long look at the way we how we behave on an individual basis, our personal responsibility to our health and to the health of our population, but the healthcare system, you know, and what it, and what it values, right. And the health illiteracy of Americans, you know, um, I, I just remember, and I'm, you know, so before I became a doctor, I was a gym teacher, right? Like I, and you know, teaching health classes. I mean, I spent entire curriculums on like, you know, getting kids to not use steroids and, and, you know, teaching them how many bones were in the body and shit like that. And like, you know, but at the end of the day, like they walk out of high school, they have no idea that the next time that, you know, for 20, they're not going to go see a doctor for most of them for like for 20 years until that day they have chest pain that's crushing and right yep. in the middle of their chest. It's the first time they're going to go into the hospital system. And then from there, they develop congestive heart failure and their kidneys fail. And now they're there. Now they're chronically ill and they have to navigate this system. Right. And never did they ever like once like be taught or told or like how this is so avoidable in the mo for the most part. All right. Well, you, I, I think we've, I think you've made your journey with it and how this developed and what your viewpoint on was on it very clear in this episode, which I really appreciate because now again, you know, we're two years out and people mm. are looking at this because things seem to be getting back to normal, which is yeah. great. Knock on wood here. Yeah. And like now they're like, they're going to start that 20, 30 year assessment of like, all right, what, what was right? What was wrong? Right. All that. And that's how be books written about this for, Absolutely. for years, documentaries, the whole nine. Yeah. But like, 
the the final point of the trade off, which you've oh, hinted yes. at now, yes. you've even in that last answer right there, you hinted at it. It's it's a personal topic for a lot of people. I I remember like back when I was first doing like marketing videos and doing short form videos. The first one I ever had that blew up on TikTok mm. was a video where I used an example of self driving cars. Okay, and I said. If the government, in a hypothetical t- scenario, if the government decided tomorrow that 50% of cars on the road were going to be self-driving cars and 50% were going to be normal driven cars, and just for the sake of numbers, you know, total arbitrary numbers, 100 people died in actual driving cars accidents, but one person died in a self-driving car accident, what's the news story? News story is person dies in self-driving car accident. Yes. And I was using it as an inflated example of bringing it back to at what point do we say we are not treating all problems in health up to and including death equally with what we're legitimately seeing from COVID. And mm. this is why I think a lot of people like suddenly went off the deep end and were like, oh, it's not real and all mm. this shit. Yes. You know, they're not in New York or they're not in a place where it's as much of a focus and they right. they convince themselves of this shit right. because they see mm. some of the stuff that you already hinted at. They see things like people are dying of drugs. Yeah. People are home and they're dying of chronic diseases and stuff that they're not getting treated. We're seeing that even beyond just death and seeing like quality of life, we're seeing that people are falling off the deep end. They yeah. have nowhere to put their anxiety. Right. They're miserable. They right. lost their job. They're losing their purpose. Morale's at an all-time low. And it started to get to a point, like you mentioned the whole CNN death counter and everything. It was so morbid that you're looking at this. I remember I, I said that November 2020 in a podcast here, an earlier podcast. And I'm like, you're looking around wondering where the light at the end of the tunnel is and at what point do we have the conversation? And the conversation doesn't need to be, oh, fuck COVID, shit, it's all over. It doesn't need to be that. It mm. needs to be, we got a problem. Yeah. We can't make it go away, but we don't want to make it worse. Right. And so you, it sounds like you saw pretty early on a lot of people, you mentioned some of the numbers, a third of the room hospital uh, of the emergency room was filled with mental health no, crises. No, th- that actually, that actually, um, I think is more of a more recent thing, right? Mm. Where it's like, where it, cause it, 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 mental illness is interesting. Like obviously people who have severe, um, underlying ment- uh, mood disorders and stuff like that will, will manifest, typically manifest early enough. And then it will be a problem that they have to deal with, right? Like bipolar depression, et cetera. But Um, people who have developed, you know, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, major depressive episodes, um, you know, uh, you know, or, or, or had a, maybe like a baby, baby obsessive compulsive personality disorder thing that kind of, all of these things grew wings and just absolutely peacocked themselves out where they were like, all right, I used to have a thing where I would get nervous and like tunnels or whatever. Now I'm having full blown panic attacks all the time, you know? Um, or, you know, like you said, my life is so shitty that I'm like, you know, I, I started taking drugs or I started drink all of these things happened. They, they sort of brewed, right? Like while, you know, during the pandemic and we weren't here, we didn't know, we weren't paying, like we weren't paying attention. This new story was the single person dying in the drive, in the self-driving car. Right. But here we are. And COVID in this case. Right. And here we are where it's like, okay. And, and, and I, and I said to a couple of my friends ago, this is supposed to be the prime of our lives. And. None of us can make a single head. Nobody can move forward right now, but time is passing Mm -hmm. and it's depressing as shit and it's making everything super difficult. And, you know, there's nothing but a constant stream of negative, negative stuff being pumped into your brain and you're watching your job disappear or, you know, you're fi- scri- scraping, clawing to keep your house, whatever. And then look at the situation we're in now. Everything's crazy. Sky- inflation was was also brewing. We're <laughs> paying attention to it now because COVID's, COVID's the third news story, if it ever is even anymore. But like now, like, the inflation story was what happened the last two years. But like all this shit was happening and like, you're just going like, how the fuck am I going to, like, what am I going to do? It pissed me off seeing the people look around and going, but, but one life and everything. I'm like, yes, but you're also ignoring that, like, you have ruined other people's lives, too. 
Like there has to be a point. I'm not one of these people like when you look at extreme libertarians and stuff, that doesn't work. You mm. can't have a single person society dispersed. Like that's just you have to have some level of tribe. You have you're, to you're have participating yes, in this. Absolutely. You have a do you have a Listen, you have a duty and a responsibility yes. to participate in a society that you also benefit from. Yes. You know? You would hope that your neighbor would call the police if your car is being robbed. Yes. And you're going to do that for them. Someone's got to show up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Come on. You know? So, but, uh, but uh, you know, I do understand that, like, you know. Um, I'm saying there's got to be the, there's some level of personal responsibility yeah, yeah, at some point. Yeah. If you look, 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 you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm, uh, I get upset sometimes when I see, you know, some healthcare people who are still advocating for like, oh my God, they're lifting mask mandates. It's like, dude, if you're not well, doesn't. if this thing could still get you and it could get anybody, don't, don't pretend like it's completely over. It's still a thing a little bit, but if you've, if you do what you need to do to try to stay healthy. Okay. You got vaccinated. You wash your hand. You do all the things. You can't keep, you, you shouldn't be kept locked in your room because somebody else is like potential, like, you know, uh, autoimmune, you know, what, you know what I mean? Like doc, someone statistically got hit by a bus in the last day and died. Does that mean buses stop? No, that's, and my, that's my point. My problem. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it's literally, I've said this all the time. Do you understand that we're sitting in a room right now where there's a statistical chance that a fucking asteroid could destroy both of us within the next 30 seconds? It's ridiculously small yeah. Yeah. and completely and totally improbable, but not impossible. Well, we also convinced people that like kids could drop by fly, like flies and shit like that, even though the data showed like that's not right, happening. Right, right. You know, it's funny because in the hot, so in the hospital system, here's an interesting, uh, you know, head butting situation in the hospital system. Um, a patient, especially an elderly patient falling on the floor is an absolute and total like can never happen event. The College of Geriatric Medicine would tell you, we would rather, we accept the fact that falls are going to happen because in the, 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 re, the ways to mitigate falls in elderly patients are more harmful than they are good. Mm. Strapping people down in bed, giving them, like restraining them chemically mm. and all these other things that we do to these elderly patients to prevent them from falling down is very harmful. But the wow. hospital systems are, you know, they're like, well, we can't get sued for that shit. So we're yes. not going to let anybody fall down. You just hit it. That's we're it. not going to let anybody, we don't give a fuck what we got to do to make it not happen. But our goal is zero falls. And this, the group who's the experts go, no, no, falls are bad. But what's worse is that you have everybody pinned down in four point restraints just because they're, you know, just because they don't know where they are right now. And that begets more delirium, et cetera. So, that, you know, there, here is the, here is the conflicting viewpoints where it's like no covid is bad but we cannot ex we we will never achieve a zero bad outcome thank you policy yes. in anything we do yes because that is bubble life and even living in bubble life you will still have freak shit that kills people all yes. the time yep you are pointing out – I'm not going to rehash it because I've done it on a lot of podcasts now, but the litigious society problem. Oh. I have a lot of friends who are lawyers who are great lawyers too. I think they're incredibly necessary and important yeah. thing. I think we probably have too many though statistically okay. right yeah. now because people – I'm not going to shit on any other field because I – People – listen. I'm just saying it like this. We have – a lawyer's job mm. – and this is correct by the way. This mm. is what they should – this is why they're incredibly necessary. Yeah. A lot of their job is risk assessment. Yes. Right? Yes. Critical. Yes. When you, it's like anything else though. When you put way too much of that at the forefront, mm -hmm. you can convince yourself not to walk out of your front door. Correct. You know? And, and so I talk about this with lawyers all the time because I'm like, you know, how do we rebalance things? Because we've gotten to a point where oh, it's hard, you want to, you're so busy covering your own ass mm. that you expose your asshole. <laughs> it's fucking great. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna trademark. That. I think that you should. Good. I think you should trademark that. I'm I, I was here. I heard it. Uh, so for whatever <laughs> lawyer you hire to tra help you trademark that, I am ready to. Co -sign. I got my dad. We'll be there okay. you go. There you go. Um. Yeah. I mean. So yes. The you know. CYA medicine or cover your ass medicine, right? Is uh got doctors over testing, prescribing shit that doesn't you know that that doesn't work, and you know uh, there's a lot of there's a ton of bad things 
um, from looking at it from like, uh, you know, the, that, that have, are as a result of people suing for every bad thing that's ever happened to them, you know, and look, I think there should be absolute and total accountability in health in healthcare, man. Like I'm telling you right now, like if, if you are a, driving a school bus of kids and you show up drunk, like you gotta, you gotta pay the piper. Oh God. You know what yeah, I mean? Like you yes, gotta pay the piper. Yes, like yes. if you're a doctor and you fuck up and it's negligent and yep. it wasn't like, you know, and it wasn't something that was, you know, people make mistakes, right? Like you could also be wrong. Like if you, you know, if, but if you had a really good, you know, if you saw the thing, if you had all of the information you needed and you developed a plan and you're like, this is why I think it's this and it's all well and good. And it turns out you were wrong. And it's sort of, that's not something you should be sued for. You were, you, you were doing what you, you know, you were doing Thank your you. best job, but you, you know, but intention. Now, yeah. I think intention is a huge part of it, right? Like, you know, if you just didn't give a shit and something bad happened, then you belong, you belong in front of the judge. Um, I'm glad you just put it like this too. This is keep going. This yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, but like, but you know, but I think, um, I think that the fear that's pumped into your brain early on when you go into this field of like, oh man, I better not, I better not do that or else I'll get, you know, I'll get sued or something like that is a really, really bad you know, it's a really bad um, path to go down because, and then, and then you see it, you see a doctor who's been sued one time, they fucking changed their whole approach, man. That's the scary part to me, man, because then it change, it takes away, mm, it takes away people's desire for gain yes. and moves towards their desire for loss prevention. Yes. And Great. that is where you don't get innovation. I would love to see, I bet you there's a study done, but I would love to see a study done that showed the testing practices ordering blood tests ordering imaging etc of a doctor who had been previously sued versus one who has never been sued mm. i would almost wow. i would almost bet i would bet a lot of money on the fact that the doctor who's been sued before um tests every potential thing every time on a, on a patient that so that, so that they don't they don't miss like right now I've, you know, I've never even, you know, knock on wood, I've never had that, that situation happen to me. Um, but I, you know, I, I certainly, my approach to medicine is that I, I use my history and interview exam and my physical exam and what information I have thus far to make a, f a couple of things it could be. And what I think it's most likely to be, I test for the thing I think it's most likely to be and any other thing that I love, I can't miss that thing too. Right. Like mm. I need to make sure it's not that thing because that thing is deadly like soon. Sure. And everything else can be tested if I'm, if I'm wrong about that stuff. Right. Because I don't, I want to do this with common sense. You know, I don't want to order yeah. a bunch of tests that don't belong. Like, why am I testing for this thing? I don't think it could it be sure, but it's pr most likely not. I'll get to that when I, when everything else has not been the case. Doctors who are playing CYA medicine, they're, they're, they're running all the tests day one. Head to toe. Which I, un by the way, oh, I, I the get same. it, brother. I, I get it. Like if I were in that situation, if, especially if I were a good person and I knew that like situation X that happened was through no fault. It yeah, shit happens, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life making damn sure that there's, again. there's never a possibility. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But we're, we're getting right to it. So let's just, let's hop right in this whole business of medicine yeah because the point you're making about the tests right there and i mean that comes back to a monetary thing too it's, it's bad, shit costs, yeah. right so i probably i pay attention to this a lot more now and you you and i were talking a little bit before the podcast about this but i remember my first time being exposed where i noticed it i was i was in college to how a lot of doctors were looking at medicine now in like not a great way yeah and I, a girl I was dating, her parents are, frankly, two of like the best doctors in the world, mm. incredible doctors, mm -hmm. and generational. Yeah. Like, like literally, their parents were doctors. Well, yeah. one of them was, and and the whole bit. And their kids were all interested in health and potentially becoming doctors or something like that. And they were quietly, not like hardcore, but they were saying, "You should think twice yeah. about doing this. Yeah. It's not the same." You, the focus is not on the patient as much anymore. The business of hospitals and medical systems in general is insane. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know about that. And so I remember being like, damn, like they're telling their kids not to do this. And then I would hear this more and more over the years from doctors talking to their kids who were maybe thinking about it And they're like, eh, I don't know about yeah. that. And to me, doctors are literally like the most important thing we have because they're health protectors. And so 
I don't know much about it, but in the little bit we talked, you think about this a lot, not just from your seat, but a bunch of seats as to how the business works and what's wrong with it. So yeah. like, for people listening, what would you diagnose as the biggest issues right now? Okay. Um, so I can preface this, I can preface my, this, my thoughts by saying that like, I would like to turn a buck in this world. I would like to be well compensated. I'm not going to lie to anybody and say that I don't want to make as much money as I can, um, you know, uh, without being, without being, without doing anything unethical or inappropriate. You know what I mean? I'd like to maximize what I can, you know, my or financially my, my, hurting my, patients. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to be able to be financially feel good about, you know, my, my finances, uh, in the back and, you know, just a little background. I owe like like close to half a million dollars in student loans to the government, right? So like that, you know, so there's that, right? Um, Necessity, yeah. So I understand that, um, that you know, it's important to recognize that there's a lot of money in healthcare, right? But I, I'll ask you a question. Um, of all healthcare spending, what percentage do you think goes to physicians, Random guess. It's Go ahead. Totally yeah, random uneducated. guess. Go random guess. Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay, that's a pretty good guess. It's eight. <laughs> of all the healthcare dollars spent in the United States, where's eight, it go? Eight percent goes to physicians. Where's the ninety-two going? Um, uh, biotechnology, farm, uh, and drugs, and and uh, hospitals and stuff like that. Like ba basically, um. If you, there's a, there's a what point. about insurance companies? No, no. So the insurance companies, what they like, so this is what oh, they duh. pay out. Yes, yes, yes. They, yes. <laughs> they are easily the most evil part of the whole scenario. However, no. <laughs> however, um, you know, there are other bad actors here too. Mm -hmm. And what we're starting to see is that as a result of doctors for a long time doing well and sort of like paying no, no attention to who was steering the ship. They were like, you know, okay, we're, we're, we're you know, I'm a, I'm a doctor and I'm doing well and, you know, medical school is expensive, but it wasn't that expensive. And I, you know, I'm financially really well and, you know, everything's good. And like, and then there was, there was business people brewing going like, hmm, a lot of money in healthcare. Mm -hmm. How do we get a piece of that? Right. So you see this line, there's a plot. You could even probably pull us like there, there is a, a graph, um, in the increase in, in, Physicians versus the increase in administra healthcare administrators over time. One line stays flat, physicians and one pay? no, no, no. The amount of people doing the job, like uh, increase in physicians versus increase in administrators. I'm wondering if you could probably find that versus graph. Increase in administrators, administrators over time graph. Yeah, oh, this is going to be rich. See if you can bring that up. All right, let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to go to images real quick. Yeah, there you go. Is that the first there, one? There, uh, any of them work? Okay. Healthcare administrators far it, outpace physicians in growth. Let me just click it, see if we can get it bigger so you can see it. <laughs> the rise and rise of the healthcare. And this is, by the way, it's interesting you're saying this. I think healthcare is the most important place to say this. This is something you can say about a lot of fields. Though. Oh, yeah. You know, academia oh, yeah. comes oh, yeah. to mind oh, yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah. But go ahead. It's but right like there. the people in the uh, people on the purple line. Um, I'm going to put this in the corner of the screen for people watching, very cool. by the way. The people on the purple line are not um, people who can diagnose, treat, or deliver treatment or care to patients. Can you do me a favor just for people listening mm -hmm. and not watching? Can you just describe this chart and what it's showing? So this, so chart, context? this chart starts in 1975 and it, is, it, is a, it, is, it shows the, um, the amount of percent increase of physicians which is very flat from 75 to 2010 there have not been that many more doctors being added to the pool despite how every year we hear there's a doctor shortage right is that on the y-axis uh, i can't uh, tell if the numbers are small uh, yes so um the the um we have we so we ha we have years uh on the x-axis on the x-axis and we have percent increase on the y-axis right okay so and oh shit! I just saw it. That I see what you're saying now. Look at the doctors one. The doctors one has not not gone anywhere. It's flatlined. Yeah, it's flatlined. Looks like a heart attack. We're doing we're, like when uh, as many doctors retire as that, that we've added because that's kept that way because they have not increased the amount of residency training positions on uh, annually. Like you, we increase the amount of medical schools creating new doctors, but we do not create more training positions for them to be like able to be clinically licensed to practice medicine. 
So people are going through medical school and they're becoming a doctor. Correct. They're becoming a doctor. No, they have the title. They have MD at the end of their name, but they are not clinically out. They are not licensed physicians because they do not train. And that is that is part, that is another part of the secret dirty side of it. They're growing. Do you have any idea what that percentage is? Uh, it's it's easily findable because so like I said, Congress and Medicare control the amount of residency positions because it is a it is funded by the government. Residency positions are funded by the government. They increase them by a small amount every year, but nowhere near as much as you would as as the amount of medical students. So the amount of unmatched. So what you would be googling right now is how many unmatched doctors are there, because matched means I got a residency spot after medical school. How many unmatched? Doctors. Doctors are there. Right, let's see if you can recognize this chart. I'm just going to go off it for one sec. In 2021, slightly more than 38,000 positions were offered in the National Residency Matching Program, NRMP, the most in program's history. A little over 35,000 were for first-year residents. So if you – like that first question, how many doctors do not match? 5% of all allopathic medical school residents – so that's just allopath. That's MD schools in the United States of America. 5% of people who graduate with an MD do not get a training All position that will allow them to allow them to practice medicine, uh, 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 to get licensed to practice medicine. And this medicine. is- And that's, gro and that's gro that number is increasing. That's what I'm saying. 5%, think about that though. 5% that, a year. It's more than that because you, they have not added DO schools. They have not added the Caribbean medical schools. They have not added foreign medical grad. Like there's- Let's keep it conservative sure, and sure. let's say 5% a yeah, year though sure. even and, and give them, throw them a bone. That compounded over, what was this other chart? Right, 5% every year. I'll put it back in the year. corner. Right. So you see how this is flattish yes. since 1975. It's because this purple line yes. that you were talking about, which is the admin adding, mm -hmm. is adding 100%, 50%, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. And the, yes. the law of compounding yes. numbers. Yes. It's, you know what this looks like? This looks just like the wealth gap chart. Oh, Almost oh, down to uh, the you year are not too. Absolutely. Absolutely. About 10 years earlier. And the, and, and um, inversely proportional to the addition of administrators is the autonomy of the physician. You know what's funny? The Steven Pinker's famous wealth gap chart, I believe, and I'm remembering this off the top of my head, I think his data in the book Enlightenment now started at 1988, right? And I'm looking at this chart. Uncle look, Ronnie. Look at what- Paging look, Uncle Ronnie. Who's Uncle Ronnie? Ronald Reagan. Oh, God. In the 80s. I mean, he created a lot of situations in the 80s before Bush 1 took over. That Fuck were, yeah. But know. look at look at this chart. What happens in 1990? That shit opens up like a V. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and 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 more importantly, so, so you're seeing, so as the person who's participating in the healthcare system from the I'm paying my premiums patient perspective, more of your dollars are going to pay for the the purple line, right? And for me... Also, physician wages are stagnant as well. Um, but we we do fit into the part, the category that like I don't want nobody's going to feel bad for me because I you know I do better than the average person, right? And I don't I don't I, nobody should feel bad for for people you know uh, who who make more than you know pop, you know. But mo what's more important to me is that like these are people that have to that tell me what to do, who are not licensed to practice medicine, and that's a problem. Like I'll give you an example. <laughs> Um, uh, a patient will come in with uh, urinary tract infections that happen often. And after a certain amount of time, the urinary tract infection grows the same bacteria, but that bacteria, you know, becomes resistant to certain antibiotics. So you have to go with a bigger gun. So I will order that bigger gun and I will get a message from the hospital pharmacist or administrator say, please ask an infectious disease doctor to order that antibiotic. I go, why? They go, because in this hospital, you are required to have an infectious disease consult in order to order an antibiotic. I go, I'm board certified in internal medicine. I'm very much aware of how to use carbapenems. The hospital's policy is that you might, like I have to ask permission to order certain medications, you know? It, 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 and that's a very, very small sliver. No, of, I understand you know I mean? exactly like, you know, um, the theme. You know, yeah. the, 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 so <laughs> for me, you know, spending my life as a knucklehead who always was like against authority, I go, what job could I do that I could like learn cool shit help people and study my tail off for 10 years. And then when I'm done, like the only person I have to answer to is my patient. Oh, I'll be a doctor. <laughs> and I could not be further from the truth there. Like mm. everybody in the healthcare system, including the insurance companies that tell you which medication they will, it's not what medication will work best. It's which one they will pay for. Right. What's the business there? Is there a, because I don't know much about that. Is mm. there a lot of, They'll pay for 
let's say drugs X and Y do the same thing and they have the same efficacy, but one company, company A makes drug X and company B makes drug Y. Is it because there's some deal that the insurance company has with company A that they're going to choose X and not Y? Most likely there's, there's, there's that's on multiple levels. They'll have like on their formulary, they'll say, Hey, we're, you know, they negotiate, everything is pre-negotiated, right? Everything is pre-negotiated. Um, generics, you know, uh, versus uh, brand names, even if, even if, and you said equal e efficacy, it's not the case. Sometimes the drug, the other drug has better efficacy. Oftentimes the one I want to write for has better efficacy with my patient, but I, they have to try the other one first and fail that before they'll pay for this one. Right. And here's the other thing. The whole prior authorization situation is basically like, I have to ask permission for the insurance company to pay for the drug there or the test that I want them to get. But really all that is, is like, Let's see how long we can keep this prick on the phone before he'll hang up and give up so we won't have to pay for this. Oh, God. Right? And then there's the float. Ready for the, the float? float? What's the float? The float is um, I submit a claim to insurance as a physician to get paid, and they will pay me a year from now. And in that year, they took that money from the patient's premium, okay, and all the patient's premiums, and they held onto it, and they put it in an account that bore interest. And then they will pay me later after they collected on that interest. That's the float. That's why they delay payments. Reimbursements take forever. Mm. And they are declined and denied and re, re da, 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 and code it wrong and all this other stuff. And it's all designed to keep the money in their pocket as long as possible before they pay you out so that they can take 7 to 12%. This is, this is the It's a thing. way to make money outside of the collection of premiums because those have to be, you know. So you got a hospital system that's being- This is the thing. You're hitting it. You're the hitting hospital it. systems, and, and so now- Individual doctors could not compete, so then they banded together, and in, in hospitals, they developed big groups. But now that has morphed into an uglier thing, an uglier monster, which is corporate medicine. What do you, what do you mean big groups? Meaning, like, if I'm, if I'm Joe, Dr. Sambatero, and I hang my shingle, and I, and I call the insurance companies, I say, I want to, you know, get, you know, X amount of dollars for an office visit, and they go, yeah, we don't pay that much. We'll give you this. And I go, okay, well, I don't want to take you. They're like, oh, no problem. Who do you have, like 1,000 people, 3,000 people? Cool. But if I get together with like 100 other doctors in the area to join a big mm. multi-specialty group, now we go, oh, well, we cover North Jersey, you know? So we have, bar we have actual negotiation power. Wow. But now corporations are involved and private equity and that kind of thing are now buying, you know, buying, uh, you know, these, these, these places are consolidating. Now they're big, humongous systems. And all I am now is a, a medical license with a heartbeat who's there to bill. And they don't give a shit what happens to the patient, dude. You said something 20 minutes ago or something like that, whatever it was, where you were saying that, and I appreciated it a lot. It's the best thing someone could say, that in listening to this podcast, you see that I like to find the middle ground right. in most situations. And I truly believe that. The answer is always in the middle. Exactly. I Somewhere. Think, I think physics and historical evidence will back me on mm -hmm. that over time, mm -hmm. that the answer does not exist right and it does not exist left or vice versa. This is another one of those situations. I often say to people, and this is overly dumbing it down, but I have never heard a good solution to healthcare because I hear Democrats and Republicans provide me solutions where I'm not going to say that this is what they are saying. I'm going to say that this ends up being more the result of what they propose. If you start with the Democrat side, they say, we don't want people dying in the streets. We want everyone covered. Mm. I go, beautiful. Right. Love that. Right. They say to do that, Let's and they don't all say this, but some of them are like, let's do socialized medicine, like okay. country X, Y, yeah. and Z in Europe. And I go, well, you have to have a free market capitalism competition because you want people to competitively want to join the industry and yes. go through all these years of schooling, right. like you did. You talked about like your value and money, and you you're a little bit. You were hesitant a little bit going over that, as a lot of people in your shoes are. You shouldn't be. You're a doctor. You spent all. You have five hundred thousand dollars of debt that you're paying off. You spent all these years to be the best of the best to treat people and save lives. You deserve to be compensated. So that scenario hurts that because it takes yes. away competition. Yes. On the other end, you have people who they're human beings. They don't want people dying in the streets and everything, but they say free market society. Let businesses figure it out, and it leads to a lot of these same problems. Yes. By the way, yes. And so you end up having people who are left behind, who have shitty plans or no plans at all. And so I look at both of, in this case, the two political parties, and I say, go fuck yourself. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. So how do you get people to a point where, like, 
you know, you're talking about these people who aren't doctors who are telling you what to do. And I say, yes, at the level they're doing it, fucked up. But at the same time, you're a doctor. Your friends are doctors. Most of you want to be doing doctor stuff. Mm-hmm. Your passion is helping people. Yeah. You're a good doctor. Right. So you don't, you'd rather not make your career being the CEO of a hospital. Correct. So you have to have some balance of it, but how do you get a balance where there's a cohesive team that's on the same page where the quote unquote admin, there's not 10 positions where there can be two and you have people who actually understand and want to understand and operate in that, as I would put it, that 50 mile an hour zone yeah. where you kind of get the benefits of both yeah. ways without going so, each way. So the answer, so the, I think, so there's uh, the answer to the health insurance system and then the answer to the hospital system is I think that you can have somebody be the administrator who's not a doctor, but the rules of how the system works for the healthcare system, not the insurance, but the healthcare system has to be written by doctors and nurses. Mm. Like, I don't care who, I don't care who like, who oversees the day to day, but the, 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 the rules and protocols of the system of the healthcare system, whether it be a individual practice or a large hospital system needs to be written by people who have clinical experience. That's it. And then you want, you want, you want some That's CEO simple. to come in and like, make sure, you know, things are done optim whatever. I, okay. But, um, patient care, you know, the patient care should be, you know, like, uh, should be the, the, the everything that governs what we do in the hospital should be create, it should be the, those rules and those protocols should be written by clinicians, nurses, doctors, uh, you know, uh, physical therapy, everybody who's in their, you know, people who deliver the care. Yeah. It's very fair. The health insurance system, um, I, I think it's, I think at one point in time it was rescuable and I don't think it is anymore. I think it's absolutely, totally, because ad- I was always of the opinion, like we live in the richest country in the known history of the world. Um, everybody should be covered, but I also think there should be the ability to add on additional care if you can, if you're like doing well, you know what I mean? Like, I think we should take care of everybody, but I also think that there should be some like ability to like you know, uh, maybe, you know, buy some additional insurance, co-insurance that would Mm. like, you know, help you maybe have a little bit wider uh, birth to get, you know, certainly not additional access to care because I think that's unethical, but something that would allow, you know, I don't know, maybe less, less hoops to jump through. I I don't know. But I think the answer was some, some convergence of, we have to take care of everybody because at the end of the day, we are taking care of everybody. People don't realize this. Like, if you don't think that we already have a socialized healthcare system that private capitalism, that capitalism preys upon, you're wrong. Because at the end of the day, people are still going to go to the emergency room. And the MTALA rule, which is that you cannot turn anybody away from emergency Correct. care, yeah. is going to make the hospital. And the hospital is then going to turn to the government for subsidy when they treat a certain amount of patients who do have no coverage. It comes to lo- – when I say that, though, I want to be clear just so I'm not – I don't sound like a total idiot because on this, I, I don't know a ton of things. So I, there's some things I'm going to be an idiot about. But when I say like, oh, dying in the streets and whatever, yes, treat at the emergency room. And Which then, is the worst place to get your care. Right. Most expensive. What about afterwards? That's right. Then right. They, then. So someone goes to the emergency room, they have cancer. They're not covered. No. They're fucked. No. They not. get to die because of their money. They get problems. sicker and then they come back into the hospital to cost the system more money and yep. the outcomes are worse, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the, it used to be that there had to be some marriage of like everybody needs to get taken care of, um, if we, so, you know, so that we're, you know, um, access to care. But I don't know anymore, dude, because it's gotten to the point. You know what I mean? Like it's gotten. Yeah, you say it's unsavable. Yeah, because because now we're at a situation where like premiums are at an all time high and deduct. Like there are so many loopholes added. Like your deductible is now not being met. By everything, everything that comes out of your pocket should meet, should count towards your deductible, but mm. it's not like there's like a million things that you would pay for. That's not going to count towards your deductible. And then even when you meet your deductible and you have coinsurance, it's like no matter what you're doing, you're coming out of pocket to pay your premium and then you're getting left over with a huge bill. And they make it complicated on purpose too. Yeah. Because they don't want that. It's a deterrent. It's yeah. a deterrent to use yeah. it. Right. Like, I mean, I think, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is anymore, but, um, you know, but, uh, well, actually I don't take insurance myself. I, I, I mean, in the, I hosp- yeah, in the hospital, yeah. I, you know, in the hospital, I am, um, I work in this, I work in a hospital, you know, part-time, but I have a private practice, 
Um, yeah, tell people. Th- let's let's close on this. I yeah. love this. Tell people what you've done there, because by the way, there's you're you're marrying new school and old school, and also working in other business models yeah. to this, like a subscription trying, model. Trying, yeah. It, I think it's a beautiful thing. And Thanks. by the way, this guy, can you? Take your phones out real quick. Yeah, sure. I want the camera to see this. This guy walked in. I used to have a bat phone too. That's a whole separate story. This guy actually needs a bat phone because yeah. he's got he's got a client <laughs> phone of yeah. patients right there because You're this like, doctor does house calls and he does he does the the what's it called the the telehealth, telehealth yeah. as well. You you're doing everything new school and old school. So tell people what's been going on. Yeah, I feel like Ari Gold. Um, <laughs> multiple cell phones. Um, Honey, it's Vince. Yes, I, I got to answer on a Wednesday at twelve o'clock if you want to live in. in I don't Beverly care if it's Hills. Passover. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so in essence, um, w- the way that I do things differently is that um, you know, and I don't know if this works for everything, but I know for a primary care perspective, from a primary care perspective, right? Because this um, is your primary care part of the business. Yeah. yeah. The average primary care doctor or, you know, group or whatever, in order to keep the lights on, has to have a massive amount of patients. And they need entire departments of people that are only there to bill, you know, electronic health records, coding, all this other stuff to get their money, right? Um, I I think there's enormous barriers to two th- to, in two ways. A, the volume of patients that you must see on a day-to-day basis provides you no ability to spend any time with any patient or get to know any patient mm-hmm. on any level that would allow you to be integrally integrally involved in their uh preventative care not just just when they're sick but like let's not get them sick right so if i eliminate that right if i eliminate the insurance part of it and say hey i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you to give me a certain amount of money every month and you are going to have unlimited access to me and my facility my uh and i'm going to deliver the care in the most convenient way for you and not limit the amount of time we spend together, not limit how often we communicate. And But the only thing I do limit is how many patients that I will take in my practice so that I can make sure that I can, because I've always said, really hard to get to know 3,000 people. Yeah. Not really hard to get to know 200, 250 people. That's a good you know, point. Like you could get to know, and, and getting to know patients um, and sort of like, you know, knowing, you know, and, and having a better, you know, sort of like out, patient outreach, like, Hey man, you're due for colonoscopy. What's up? How, what's the deal? Like, Oh doc, you know, that just having these relationships where they feel comfortable divulging things to me and sort of like, you know, making sure that I'm, we are up to date on up to speed on all the things they're doing. And, you know, they feel comfortable like telling me like, you know, Hey, this medication doesn't work all of these things and the ability to say, Hey, I'm not feeling well. Can we talk? And I will right now call a doctor's office. Maybe you can see him in three weeks, her, him, whoever. Yeah. Um, I'll talk to you today. If I need to see you in person, let's do it tomorrow. That was one of the reasons my doctor, Dr. Chris, too, is like my guy. I'm good friends with Mm -hmm. him. It was one of the reasons I really loved him early on and was like, oh, this guy's, this guy's amazing. I was always lucky because I had family Mm -hmm. by where i lived Mm -hmm. like my uncle greg's a phenomenal doctor so Mm -hmm. i was spoiled i can call him up whenever right then i moved way out of town didn't have that anymore i gotta find somebody everyone always has a horror story about doctors but like dr chris do early on i would like test it and i'd call because i'm a little bit of a hypochondriac i'd call and i'd be for hypochondria is more frequent visits to the doctor that's the treatment for hypochondria exactly exactly so i'm one of those guys let me tell you you're okay expense more often so i would do that and i'd call him up and he would make time yeah. He would invent time. I'm yeah. like, oh, that's rare. And right. I'd say to, I'd, I'd ask friends about their doctor. They're like, I don't fucking even know my guy. Yeah. Right. Like no one does that. And yours does that by default Yes, because you're, you're doing it all yourself on this end of things yeah. as well. And like, what would you say you do? Like you're reachable at all times. You keep a tighter book. Mm-hmm. You said like 250 people yeah. to be yeah. able to know them, yeah. but you also, you have like a subscription model to be able to make it worth your right. while. So that's the thing. So like I said, uh, in order to ha- instead of having like three to 5,000 people that I bill insurance per visit, like uh, you subscribe, you, you, you become a member of my practice. Right. And what do you pay? Um, it's, so it's a stratified, it's a stratified, uh, amount based English. on age. So if you're, uh, up to 45 years old, you pay $150 a month. If you're between 45 and 55, you pay $200 a month. And if you're 55 and older, you pay 250 bucks a month. If there's, some, if, there's a, if there's financial hardship, there's always room to negotiate and talk and sort of, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the point is, is that this is called like direct primary care or concierge medicine. There's not necessarily interchangeable, but more, but I don't charge your insurance anything and you never will pay any additional fee to me, uh, you know, for your, 
you know, for your, for your membership, you know what I mean? And the truth be told is like yourself, you know, you pay for, you pay more for your cell phone right now, typically. And this is your health. Then, then have me, you know, um, available to you within a day or that day, you know what I mean? To take care of, you know what I mean? To take care of something. So, um, the people that I have, uh, are people that are invested in their, you know, in their health. They like the fact that, that, that I, I'm available to them when I am, you know what I mean? Um, not everything is, it requires an hour. Sometimes, most of the time, 90% of the stuff can be handled with a quick text message. It's like, hey, document on my metformin. All right. Yeah. Okay. You're due for that. Yeah. All right. Um, also, by the way, um, you know, we're going to check your sugar in three weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. And boom, it's handled. Wow. There's no six, there's no half a day off of work to sit in the doctor's office for six hours while people cough on you. You know what I mean? Like, you know, hey, doc, I'm having palpitations. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, one o'clock. What are you doing? I'll be home. All right. I'll be by with my EKG machine and we'll see if there's any rhythm issues there. What I like about this is you found, your own solution. And now, as you explained to me, more people are doing it. This is mm. not like, yes. like it's still rare, but it's not extremely rare. Yeah. Like there are people who are doing it. And along the way, not just solution for you, also a solution for your patients, also a more personal, the most personal solution yeah. there is mm -hmm. and mixing the two worlds, yeah. new school and old school. I yeah. love it. Because we're getting, we're getting, we're getting uh, sort of the relationship that people used to have with their doctor. And I think the the biggest reason why the respect and trust for patients between patients and their physicians is broken down is because the patient is now re greatly removed from access to their physician. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you're just a chart yeah. in the, in the normal system. And that's not the doctor's fault. You know, like for the most part, that's not the doctor's fault. It's like, it's that chart. It's the purple lines fault. Yeah. Screw you purple line. Doc, this was, uh, we're, we're, we just did like about three hours right there. And this was high octane, a ton of information. We didn't even talk like a ton about hormones today, I which I know you're really good at. I had a great time. But I had a great time too, man. I, I think this was um, incredibly transparent for people too. And I, I, if, if I can give that a platform from mm. the medical community, especially now, just given all the infighting mm. that society has, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. And it's one thing that we haven't done a ton of in here yet. So I really, really appreciate you coming no, in. Thank you and, very and much open. Uh, for, you know, um, I've never done anything like this. This was, uh, you're going to do one again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I, you know, I think this was like, um, you know, normally I'm telling this type of stuff to my friends and it's like, you know, it's a very much of a peel back of the onion and, you know, like kind of exposing, like, you know, the, What's going on with the Wizard of Oz back there? Like, who's the man behind the curtain? Mm -hmm. and, and and the system is big and it's overwhelming and it's scary and you get shuffled through it. And um, both patients and doctors have to realize that there are other ways to do this. But um, nobody nobody ever tells you. So unless you like, you know, it's like playing like like a like Zelda one where it's like you didn't you didn't bomb every wall when you were a kid. Like you'd never know where the Triforce was. Like you have to get lucky. You know what I mean? Like to figure <laughs> this shit out. So. Um, you know, there, there is other ways to get, to get a uh, high quality care delivered to patients, have a better lifestyle, like work, work life balance for physicians and make the overall relationship more effective and safe and, and productive. Well, thank you for sharing it today. Some of it, I know we'll talk about it again in the future, but once again, I, I really appreciate it. And, and you did a great job. Today. Thank you so much. All right. Everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace. <laughs>